Hello and welcome back everyone, we weep online and today I'm gonna continue the series What if FM Orochimaru was obsessed with Naruto part 2. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload. Now wasting no more time, let's begin. Sarutobai hurries and sat at his desk, puffing on his pipe. He was distressed by the information he was given. Jiraiya and Orochimaru had finally given him everything they'd known about the Akatsuki, and everything they'd given him led to one conclusion. He wasn't the outcome he desired. This was supposed to be unique. Hadn't he done enough of this? Have you had enough? Have you had enough? Was he supposed to get himself ready for this one more time? Was this divine retribution for failing to live up to his ideals? For his previous transgressions, he was supposed to give something better to the next generation. Maybe he can still do it. He tried to reason his way out of it, to come up with an alternative, but he came to a halt. That was what had gotten him into this mess, always looking for the easy way out when problems demanded more. But there was so much to do that he'd have to risk the daimyo's wrath, but it was necessary. Two letters were sent, one to daimyo to justify his need to remain in the chair for a little longer. The other goes to Rasa, soon as assistance would be greatly appreciated. But if he declined, Haruzen would have to make do. Allowing this Akatsuki to do whatever they wanted would be foolish, especially since he bore some responsibility for its rise. Orochimaru savored every poisonous word as she described how his refusal to neutralize Danzo resulted in yet another adversary with a grudge against Kanoha. But now was not the time for remorse. He'd given himself and his forces six months to get to their destination. They were then going to war with Akatsuki and Aim. Even saying the word war made me feel heavy. It was an acknowledgement that you would be sending some of your forces to their deaths, which you had done before the first order was issued. But this organization, with its unknown agenda other than collecting Biju, was too dangerous to be allowed to operate in the shadows. He'd have to get Tsunade more medical ninja training. He wouldn't dismiss the value of that advice again. He'd have Jury a beef up his spy network now that he didn't have to divide his attention between Odo and the Akatsuki. Haruzen wanted every piece of information he could get his hands on. So many plans, so much planning. With the peace they'd had, his village had gotten soft, too comfortable. The village mirrored his own decline in many ways. When he thinks of Orochimaru, his decline becomes clear. She's beaten him every step of the way. He'd been so thoroughly outplayed that it was over before he realized what was going on. But this last order was exactly what she desired. She backed him into a corner, leaving him with only one viable option. Jiria could eventually train him, but she was correct, their skills didn't complement each other beyond a shared interest in Fuenjutsu. He hoped he wasn't damning a boy he saw as a grandson and who saw him as a surrogate grandfather. He hoped that not even Orochimaru's taint would be enough to darken his soul, but it was necessary, and just as Shinobi endured, Naruto would have to. Request for apprenticeship by San and Orochimaru, named apprentice Naruto Yuzumaki, approved by Sarutobai Haruzen, Sandame Hakage. He wasn't in a lot of pain, some discomfort, but he could deal with it. A part of him wished he hadn't ended up back here, taken down in two strikes by a vastly superior opponent. But he was still alive and hadn't been impaled or shaved. He also possesses another legendary sword. Overall, it was a good day for Naruto Yuzumaki. He's done shinobi work and deserves to rest like a shinobi. The unwelcome, uninvited, and inconsiderate guest in his room does not share this opinion at all. How did you do it? I'm curious. I heard you the first time, Uchiha-san. I'm sorry my convalescence has delayed my response time to your queries. How I did it is simple. Neither he nor his partner took me seriously, and I was able to delay them long enough for the freaking Sanin to arrive. What makes you so special that he would care about you? I'm sure the no offense part is implied, and in response, it doesn't matter. I don't have anything else to say on the subject, so please leave my room. Sasuke realized he was bothering the redhead who wasn't in the hospital for fun. He could have returned another time or gone to someone else, but his desire for vengeance fueled the jealousy he felt for the Yuzumaki. Itachi had told him he wasn't worth killing, but this kid his age. What made him worthy and why? In a fit of rage and childishness, Sasuke grabbed Naruto by what should have been the collar of his shirt while still wearing his face mask and demanded Naruto answer his unasked questions. Naruto was never defeated by the villagers. On his birthday, he was never chased in, and there were no mobs to avoid. As a result, he developed the impression that even they thought physical violence was a step too far. That wasn't the case, it was just that physical violence attempts resulted in immediate execution which was one of the few things H. Uruzen was adamant about. As a result of this, Naruto developed a rule that was more subconscious than anything else. He'd ignore them if they never touched him or vandalized his property. 
He may dislike them, but he will disregard them. But no one touches him without a reaction. He would respond to violence with violence and would not apologize. He didn't bother making Sasuke remove his shirt because it wouldn't matter. And three hand gestures performed faster than an eye blink demonstrated why as his once languid hair had grown into crimson spikes long enough to impale the wall next to his bed. But there was no Achiha clinging to the wall. Ma, ma, Naruto-kun, that was a little strong, wasn't it? Kakashi said, holding his wide-eyed student, quickly realizing how close he'd come to death. He wanted to scream at the redhead, but the look in Yuzumaki's eyes dared him. He shouldn't have put his hands on me, Naruto said, finishing his jutsu and letting his hair fall back into place. Hi, he shouldn't have, but surely the penalty for such an offense isn't death. Kakashi responded with an eye smile, and Naruto nodded. Sasuke became concerned because he couldn't tell if either party was joking or not. What on earth happened in here? Please, Tsunade Obachan, no yelling. Tell me then, why are there two holes in the wall that weren't there when I left? Sasuke and Naruto had a bit of a miscommunication. Tsunade Sama, I accept full responsibility and will be disciplining my student for his outbursts, Kakashi said as he drew Sasuke away. He didn't want to be near an enraged Tsunade. Tsunade performed a quick diagnostic on Naruto and was satisfied with his recovery, but he wouldn't let him leave. She was surprised when he didn't complain and simply asked for a soft light to read in, which she had the support staff provide and then left him to his devices. He was on his knees, panting for breath. His training session had not gone as planned. His timing was incorrect. His equilibrium was shaky. He used to move gracefully, but now he plods. He must fight his instincts, which are telling him to use a hand that no longer exists. The phantom pains are still present, and he recalls them in his dreams. It follows him whether he is aware of it or not. So much had been taken from him in such a short period of time. The daimyo had ordered the end of the cage bird seal, which meant that the branch family would be free and able to form their own clan in restitution for generations of oppression. Neji should be happy, but he can't help but think their freedom was bought with his arm, and he's not sure if it was worth it. He is liberated, but he is also diminished. He was once a servant, but he was strong and capable. Prodigious, more than capable. He thought his potential was limitless, but now he's broken. Neji trains while his fellow branch members cheer, and the main family speaks empty words about relocation. He trains, 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 and she observes. He can sense her gaze on him. Every twitch, every moment, nothing escapes her gaze, her eyes sharper than most people believe. He despises her eyes, eyes that presume to scrutinize him so closely, picking apart his every flaw, exposing him completely to her scrutiny. How could someone so frail have such eyes? Eyes that pierced him when he told her of her fate. Eyes that see him as less than. Eyes of the entitled, blessed, and chosen who can't bear the weight of luxury. She falters in the face of minimal expectation always seeking to deviate from tradition when tradition is what keeps the Hyuga strong. She's a flop, and he despises her. Without her, he'd have his father. If it weren't for her, his father would be free. She takes, takes, takes from him. Her lack of talent is equal to his genius. The two are diametrically opposed. What harms one benefits the other, so neither can rise. His injury gave her strength. Was the Uzumaki her representative? She was sent to avenge her loss because she was too weak to do so on her own. Why else would he be so cruel to a complete stranger? She started it all. She is now watching him to see her masterwork, the fruits of her labor, his struggle. That scumbag, stop watching me, says the narrator. His breathing has become more erratic. He can't stand it any longer. Even when you're hurt, you're still a genius, Nai-san, she said calmly. What does that mean? Are you making fun of me? How could I mock you when we are family? The breaking of the seal does not make us family. You and I can never be family, so enjoy your fleeting victory, it will not last. I take no joy in your disability, and watching you struggle provides no entertainment for me. I'm not who you think I am. You are, fate has decided. Then fate was always going to take your arm, and if I found it amusing, that would be fate as well. You should have no feelings on the matter, correct? It is all predestined, Neji says, and Hinata takes that as her cue to leave. She did not tell the truth. It gave her no pleasure to see Neji in pain. What pleasure could you derive from seeing someone suffer in pain when you sincerely wished them dead? Her plans were coming together much faster than she could have imagined. She knew that with the information she had, the Akatsuki the old fool would feel the need to be proactive. He hadn't lost all of his instincts, but she assumed he'd be too soft to lead the charge, that he'd postpone it for a year or two and leave it to his replacement. But this is almost as good. 
he'd have to sit in that chair and live with the disgrace as many of his top jown and wonder if he'll go to war to keep power. The man of peace being labeled a warmonger. It was delicious, but it didn't give her the same satisfaction as him assigning Naruto to her. She assumed she'd get him before Jiria went to prepare for a training trip, just like he did for Minato. But no, he's hers entirely. Sarutobai claims it's only for the six months leading up to the invasion, but that should be enough time to prepare him. She simply couldn't wait any longer. Juria's expression when the old monkey made his decision was just the icing on the cake. He could only glare, his only expression of impotent rage. She would prepare Naruto and, with the help of Konoha, vanquish all of their enemies. The old monkey can then fade away into obscurity while she and Naruto-kun continue to break down barriers. She couldn't wait any longer. She was on her way down the final path to her compound, where her former apprentice awaited her. You appear to be content. Whose soul did you consume today, sensei? Oh, Anko-chan, you stink of disappointment and sake, but you always think of disappointment. Fuck you, babe. You've never been my type. From what I've heard, it's the red hair or the prepubescent penis. You've turned out to be a crass little trollop, and I'd like you not to speak of my new apprentice in that manner. God, the old man has really given up, hasn't he? To allow you to be the master of anyone is criminal except him. I'm not sure if I should try to kill you to save him or kill him to save the rest of us. Hanko spoke and was immediately lifted off the ground by a firm hand around her throat. Poor little Anko. She never knew when to shut up. I should really snap your neck right here, but that's what you want. One final act to show Sensei cares. Be honest, you weren't mad I left, you were mad I left you. How could I? You want to know why? Why I gave you the curse mark and left you in that lab? Because the depths to which you disappointed are difficult to articulate. I thought you were someone like me but you and now you threaten Naruto-kun because I see his value, having nurtured it in a far less direct way than I did with you. And yet look at him, at how much he's accomplished because he was willing to do so, Orochimaru said, dropping Anko to the ground. Anko immediately began rubbing her throat, attempting to relieve the pain. People think I want another me, someone in my image who thinks like me. Why would I want that? I'm not that egotistical, I don't need a replacement or an heir to some imagined throne. Unlike most of you unremarkables, I don't want to change Naruto in the least, even if that version is my antithesis. Yeah, right. No one would believe that. Orochimaru smiled, knowing that was exactly what she was hoping for. He would and he will. He isn't beholden to groupthink and is willing to find things out for himself. But I'll tell you like I told Sarutobai and Juria, Anko, if you interfere with my apprentice or try to influence him in a way I don't like it won't be healthy for you. And if that's too cryptic, I'll be literal. I'll kill you, Anko. Do we have an understanding? Seeing her former student isn't responding Orochimaru grabs her hair and pulls her head back. Are we on the same page, Anko? Hi. Good girl. Now run along and try to be a little more polite the next time we speak. You're a Kanoichi, not a corner girl. He looks at his charge, unsure what to say. His words fall on deaf ears, and he's never been one to give speeches, it's just not his thing. He's the cool, aloof, brilliant, and extremely cool type. You're supposed to hang on every word he says. But this kid is immune to coolness. It was perplexing. It was annoying. But it had never been dangerous. Sasuke had no idea why Naruto had such a strict rule. But he should learn that his emotional outbursts can get him hurt. If it had been another senior ninja, they might have just snapped his wrist and moved on. But he'd rather risk his student's health. So the boy is now bound with ninja wire, staring at Kakashi with all the hatred his little body can muster. But at least he is wise enough not to activate his Sharingan, or Kakashi would have had to pop him one. I know you despise Itachi. I understand why. No one can blame you for wanting him dead, for it to be a driving motivator in your life. But these childish temper tantrums, that has to stop, Sasuke. You almost got skewered today because you violated the personal space of the wrong shinobi. And your revenge would have been moot if I hadn't been there. How could I have known he'd react like that? We're trained killers. He was just ambushed by two S-ranked ninja. If you knew nothing else you should assume he'd be a little worked up having survived what should have been certain death or defeat. And he had a concussion, so your shaking and yelling wasn't helping matters. The boy hung his head in shame. Something finally got through to him. I just wanted to know why Itachi thought he was so valuable. What made him so unique? What difference would knowing make? Shouldn't you just be relieved he's in custody and no one else died to make it happen? I heard he stabbed him in the back, which no Genin or Chunin should be able to do. Why? He's not invulnerable and he's not a god. And, as Naruto mentioned, he was with the Sanin. All of them. Do you think none of them would be able to make Itachi leave a small opening in his defense? That's the thing about this profession, Sasuke. 
It only takes one time to fall into the right trap or fall for the right trick and powerful or not you die. Does he feel well enough to speak? Yes, but don't push it. If Naruto hadn't been concussed, the new Ibari would have pierced his heart and killed him instantly. I don't feel particularly fortunate, Tsunade-sama, Itachi remarked, a small smile on his face. Shut up, brat, you didn't get your last checkup. Being a missing min makes it difficult to maintain a consistent schedule, especially with the Akatsuki beginning their initial play. What can you tell me about that, Itachi-kun? Inquired the Sandam. Leader Sama wanted to put the youngest Jinchuriki to the test and assess their threat level because we wouldn't be pursuing them for a few years. What's the holdup? The Mizukage is no longer alive, Sandame Sama, and the Sandai will not reform for at least three years. Do you think it'll take them a long time to replace you and Kasame? I'm not sure, S-rank Nuke Nin aren't common, and they really need to be that caliber. Perhaps a year or year and a half, Itachi speculated. Good, good. Itachi, you return now in a time of upheaval. Some of my past transgressions have come to light, so I am not long for the chair. But I will not leave the Akatsuki to my replacement. I must once again call on your service. I believe Maelstrom will need you now more than ever. What do you mean? Itachi inquired. Even Tsunade was perplexed by the new danger Naruto had found himself in. Orochimaru has returned. She gamed the daimyo to make it so and has been five steps ahead of me. She wants Naruto. I'm not sure why, but she is currently the one best suited to raise his skill level quickly. I know my student. She will demand he be subjected to a period of isolation. Just her and whoever she may choose to aid in his development. As his master, she has that right. But as a clan heir, I agree, Hakage-sama, but how about Sasuke? I believe you should have the right to choose. Inform him of the truth, and I'll do everything I can to mend your broken bond. If you want him to remain unaware, I can claim you're in a secure facility, or even succumb to your injuries. No one would believe you fell to the Sanin. When should I begin keeping an eye on Naruto-kun? You'll be on bed rest for at least five more days, no debate, Tsunade said flatly. Then you'll have your answer no later than that, Sandame sama Sandame says, leaving Itachi's room and heading for the exit. When this aim problem is resolved, I want you to take my place. I'm sure you do, but I politely decline. Please, Tsunade, the village will require strong leadership. Then let Juria do it, it's about time he stopped acting like a spy anyway, and he'd take the job just to spite Orochimaru. That's part of the problem. He'd go out of his way to antagonize her, which would end in disaster, a disaster with Naruto in the middle of it, and that's involved as well. So, you think I'll keep Jiraiya and Orochimaru from killing each other and keep your Jinchuriki stable? No, I don't want anything to do with this. Also, why would Naruto be in the middle? He doesn't seem to realize Jiraiya is his godfather. At this point, Jiraiya is just his father's sensei who half-assed his Chunin finals training. She has something planned for Naruto, and Jiraiya will not stand by and watch it happen. And will I? No, you won't antagonize her unnecessarily. And since you're his Obachan, if you warn him, he'll believe you. No, he'll think about it and look for proof, most likely because he's had to learn to rely on himself from a young age. Funny how that works. I can't have that fight again, Tsunade. Just, you're the best choice, and maybe with you in the chair, this village can regain something it lost under my leadership. And you might even inspire Naruto to want to be Hakage again, Sarutobai said, drawing a glare from Tsunade. All the more reason not to take the hat. If he gave up on that idiotic dream, so be it. He'll live longer, maybe have a family, and find some happiness. Tsunade, just think about it. Until then, you have your medical training program. Train as many medics as you can. And then start seriously training yourself. PFFT, old man, take your own advice. You'll get your damn medics three decades late. As for that other thing, don't count on me accepting. It's bad enough I'm here and having to deal with this nonsense again. The next day, Team Kurenai arrived at Sandame's office. The ceremony was brief, and everyone was informed that Shikamaru and Shino had been promoted to Chunin, making Team Kurenai the first team to do so during their first exam since the Sanin. The vests and new promotion were accepted by both boys. Kurenai and Naruto were both pleased that the entire team was given the opportunity to succeed together. Haruzen paused for them to enjoy themselves before continuing. While this is good news, it also represents a change. While you are allowed to remain as a team, and I would recommend that you do, Naruto will officially be entering into an apprenticeship, Haruzen said, seeing the surprise on all of their faces. I'm sure Naruto told you who attacked him, yes. He continues, we have received a great deal of information about this organization and where they are located. This isn't a class secret, I'm only telling you because of your connection to Naruto. In six months we will be invading AIM with the intention of ending the Akatsuki threat, which is why Naruto will be entering into an apprenticeship. 
If he's a target, shouldn't he be left out of the invasion? Turin I inquired, clearly concerned about her student. If Naruto were some low-level Chunin, yes, but he isn't, and his combat prowess will be needed. As he is now, I'd allow him to go. But after our ramp up, I'm more than confident he'll be prepared. I've already spoken with your fathers, and they have agreed to increase your training as well. You will still take missions, but they'll be primarily combat-oriented so you have field Naruto. Your training with Orochimaru starts in a week. She's asked that you not take missions and focus solely on her training during that time. She'll pick you up from your apartment on the day you start. You'll have your nights free so you don't lose contact with your team. If you have no questions, you are all dismissed. The team dispersed, the newly promoted Chunin going to their training grounds, but Kurenai had other plans. She couldn't dismiss Anko's words as paranoia. She knew Naruto and the Sandame had a strained relationship, but she assumed that if Orochimaru did intend to harm him, the Hakage would protect him. He did, however, assign her student to the Viper herself. Even as a Jounin, there are things she is unaware of, and the Hakage has made it clear that he has no intention of telling her. That only increased her anxiety. It didn't help that she'd met the Sanin briefly while visiting Naruto. Kurenai was a Jounin, albeit a new one, and she was slightly intimidated by Orochimaru's passive presence. The woman lacked supreme confidence, as if she was always busy and you were just a toy for her to play with. It was unsettling, and Naruto would be subjected to it for at least six months. If she couldn't stand being near an alleged ally, how could she possibly protect Naruto from those who were after him? She couldn't in her current state. She must improve herself, just as her students must. She needed to broaden her skill set, shore up any flaws, and get creative with what she was good at. She had a lot of work to do, but she knew there was a generalist, someone who was good at everything but wasn't particularly good at anything in particular. She arrived at her destination on time, knocking more frantically than she had intended. The resident soon opened the door and greeted her. I need your assistance, Asuma. He walks with a sure stride and a stern expression. It does not reflect his true feelings, but it is what is expected of him as a Hyuga. Expectations and perceptions are important. He wishes his eldest daughter understood. He wishes a lot for her, most notably that she didn't despise him and her clan. He can see it, and anyone who bothers to pay attention to Hinata can, but most don't. He is correct. He knows it's his fault, the coldness and lack of affection he instilled in her soon after her mother died and she was almost kidnapped didn't break her, but it did make her quiet and distant. She tolerates him, Hanabi, and everyone else, and if it didn't result in a cage bird seal, she'd probably leave the clan to be free of them. Yes, the Bayakugan sees everything, and he sees her desire to be free of them. Her clan is nothing more than burdens she can't cast off. He has no idea how to approach her. Her eyes are filled with hatred for him, and any attempt to mend what is broken between them is rejected. He was frail, a frail man who hid behind tradition in a mask to conceal his overwhelming grief. He could, and should, have put an end to the division between branches. He could have freed his brother, but he wanted to be the perfect Hyuga leader to do what was expected of him to appear strong while succumbing to the forces of habit. It was a contradiction. Hinata is more powerful than him in many ways. She actively opposes tradition and chooses to fight it regardless of her critics. He should have encouraged it more instead of favoring Hanabi, but Hanabi made things easier. Hanabi's gaze did not pass through him, judging him unworthy. They didn't ask silently why he was still alive when his superior parent and brother had both died, leaving this empty shell of a man. He saw Hinata, and Hinata saw him and let him know she found him wanting at best, and his continued existence offensive at worst. She was lost to him because she had no desire to reconcile, and no amount of apologizing, which he has never done, could make things right. He'd convinced himself of this so that the tolerance doctrine could continue. A permafrost between parent and child, all because he prefers to appear strong rather than be strong. But it was his nephew, not his daughter who brought him here, the one person he may have wronged even more than Hinata. The boy had lost himself since the Chunin finals, and not even removing the seal that had cursed him had lifted his spirits. Neji had his talent and the respect it earned him when he thought himself a slave and had little. But what about now? He now believes it's all gone and has begun to tell stories about Hinata setting it up. She doesn't deny it, only scoffing at his faith in fate. He can respond, but it only fuels his rage and depression. The Sandame informed all Jounin of the impending invasion and advised them to increase their training as well as the training of anyone under their command. Hayashi believed that if Neji could participate in this invasion, if he could distinguish himself, he could recoup his losses. But he'd have to fix his arm first. He could go to Suna, but past experience has shown that their prosthetics and the gentle fist don't get along. Instead, he came here to strike a deal with the devil herself. 
he was surprised to be greeted by the Yuzumaki when he arrived at the manor. The boy managed to greet him with the proper honorific, but Hayashi could tell it felt like ash in his mouth. While they are nothing more than potential right now, they boy will be powerful one day, and this may be a relationship he needs to repair. Another instance where being a joyless hard-ass has done more harm than good. Hayashi was escorted to an office by the Yuzumaki, who excused himself. Orochimaru arrived moments later, beaming with self-satisfaction. Can I help you today, Hayashi? My nephew requires an arm replacement and I'm hoping you can assist. Hyukuku, I'm sure I can assist Neji-kun with his minor issue. And how much will it cost me? Money is not an issue. Money I have, and why wouldn't I help such a promising shinobi? He is, after all, a comrade. No, no money is required. However, your gratitude would be invaluable. And if I'm asked to act on this gratitude in the future, it would only be fair. Hayashi asked, knowing he'd stepped into her trap. Her pocket wasn't where he wanted to be, nor was it where his clan needed to be. But he'd do it for his nephew and deal with the consequences later. So, do we have an agreement? She inquired, her smile never leaving her face. We do. All right, I'll meet him at the hospital in a week. I should have something by then, but I need his measurements as soon as possible. It will be completed. Thank you for your time and efforts. Of course, I enjoy assisting. Naruto panted on the private training grounds. He was surrounded by scorched earth, others with deep grooves carved into them, and still more soaking wet. He'd just finished his assessment, demonstrating his abilities in Nin, Gen, and Teijutsu, and he'd demonstrated the majority of what he could do. She shrugged it all off as if it were a piece of cake. He doesn't believe he is on the level of a Sanin, but he would like to make his opponent put forth some effort rather than just smile at him as if he were a baby taking his first steps. He was, however, tapped out. He'd basically shown her everything, with a few surprises tucked away. Naruto could feel exhaustion approaching. He should have passed out by now, but his steely determination had kept him going. He couldn't tell how she felt about his demonstration because she kept the same neutral expression the entire time. And at this point he didn't care because he needed a nap. Naruto thudded to the ground, causing Orochimaru to laugh. She was both pleased and irritated by his performance. He would be further ahead and have more experience if he had been given proper direct when he graduated and allowed to promote when he earned it. If nothing else, he needs the experience because much of what he knows hasn't yet become instinctive, so his transitions to some tactics aren't smooth. But she had six months to iron out the kinks and broaden his skill set. She could see why he preferred his sword, his stature made Teijutsu with anyone older, and thus larger, than him a chore. His skills were certainly commensurate with his rank, and she could tell he put in the effort to keep them sharp, but he wouldn't see a true leap until his body matured. She made a clone, sent it to Naruto's room, and then summoned Naruto's new shadow. Sarutobai sensei obviously thought his little gambit was clever, but he needed to be reminded of why she was so far ahead of him and how any piece he puts into play can be turned or neutralized. Aren't you going to come out and say hello, Itachi-kun? She asked after the shadow refused to reveal himself. I'm sure you've heard about Danzo. Such a pathetic end to a once proud shinobi. I'm curious, after he ordered you to kill your family, why didn't you ever kill him? Itachi appeared in front of her. I suggest you drop this topic, he said monotonously. Or will you attack me? Chance revealing you're still alive. Poor Sasuke-kun, no family, no vengeance, he's so lost, he may require guidance. You will not approach Sasuke, I may or may not, and there isn't much you can do about it. Hyukuku, but back to my question, why didn't you kill Danzo? If someone forced me to choose between two things I cherished, I might choose one. But I would certainly kill the person who forced me to choose the other. Did you even consider it? She asked, seeing no response. He was disciplined, but she had the impression she was having an impact. Or are you unable to act without orders? She asked as she entered her manor, leaving Itachi alone with his thoughts. As much as he tried to deny it, the Sanin was correct. Danzo was a threat. He should have removed him to protect Sasuke from his schemes and to prevent Shisui from finding an alternate solution. But he didn't. He only followed orders, and while the village avoided civil war as a result of his decisions, his brother bore the brunt of his decisions. It was difficult to accept, but it was the truth. Sasuke would struggle to move on unless he obtained justice with his own hands, and that was Itachi's fault, not anyone else's. You know, I really enjoy spending time with you. As you should expect, I'm pleasant company and a lovely lady. I'm 12, but let's go with that. My point is that since I enjoy spending time with you, Shizune, and Tauntin, you don't have to carry me, I'm not going to flee, Naruto said, who was currently under Tsunade's arm. It was humiliating, for crying out loud, he's a chunin. When he awoke from his nap, 
he showered and changed into civilian clothes, fully prepared to finish his treatise on the battle applications and limitations of the Shunshin no Jutsu, which he titled The Battle Applications and Limitations of the Shunshin no Jutsu, until Tsunade stormed in and abducted him once more. Shishu just stood there and waved, smiling the whole time. If it didn't add to Tsunade's amusement and shame, he'd pout. But you must be embarrassed by an older family member. It's a rite of passage. Oh joy. SHH, it's not that bad. The only reason people aren't laughing at me is because they think you're going to punch them in the face. And I will so you have nothing to complain about, besides we're here. He was standing in front of a small bar, apparently drinking his dinner again. Shizun joined them shortly after they arrived and they chatted away between drinks. Naruto sensed something was bothering Tsunade but didn't want to ruin her mood. After a few bottles, she got a distant look in her eyes and asked Naruto a question he hadn't expected. Brat, why don't you want to be Hakage anymore? Isn't giving up against your Nindo? Naruto paused for a moment, taken aback by the question. When he let go of his dream, he just busied himself with training and work, as he had done with so many other things in his life, but he can still remember the day he stopped believing it was possible. I didn't stop wanting it, I just stopped believing it was a realistic goal. Why? Shizune inquired. He appeared depressed, so it was something he didn't want to talk about. But it's better to get these things off your chest. When you guys treated me, after I returned and gave my debrief the old man, of course, denied me my promotion. But he had this look in his eyes, pleading with me to understand him, to sympathize with him. He held all the power, but he acted as if he were the victim of these large forces outside of his control. I hated him in that moment, sincerely I hated him in his entirety. But Chunin, who was with you after Ishwal, he came around, Shizun mentioned. True, but Nichin, there are thousands of shinobi in Konoha. How could I possibly work with enough of them to change the opinion of me en masse? The numbers simply didn't work out, and aside from some catastrophic event or a war, which I'd never wish for, I didn't see another path with the Hakage actively working against me. So, I dedicated myself to improving my skills as a shinobi, inside and outside of combat. All I had was the willingness to outwork everyone. But when you're shown that hard work doesn't matter, what's left? Becoming some fiend like Danzo, always plotting and scheming in the dark. That's not me. Instead I decided I'd be the strongest ninja in the village, one no one could ignore. Even if I never was named Hakage, I'd make the sitting Hakage look like an Alsoran in comparison. Tsunade laughed. It sounded like something Kushina would say, and it was reassuring to know that, while he was often serious, his spirit had not been broken. Why did you inquire? Sensei told me you used to want to be Hakage, and I was just curious. You know, I've lost a lot of people to that dream, so many that I came to despise the position. Irrational, probably, but I just did. A selfish part of me was relieved when he said you'd given up, because it meant I wouldn't have to lose you as well. But if being Hakage is what you truly want, you shouldn't let. I suppose, but I haven't thought about it in a while. Think about it, or don't. It's up to you in the end, but don't let that old bastard be the reason you don't try. Don't give him that power. I'll think about it. After that, the mood lightened, and the trio continued to enjoy the night. Jiria had returned to the village, unbeknownst to them. When Sarutobai sense informed him that Naruto would be apprenticed to Orochimaru, he was enraged that Haruzen would give Naruto to Orochimaru for any length of time. He went to collect himself but returned, hoping to persuade his sensei that this was a bad idea. Haruzen tried to persuade Jiria that this was the best option for the time being. No argument could calm the Sanin, who was worried about what her influence would do to his godson. Jiria stormed out of Haruzen's office, thirsty for a drink. He happened to choose the same establishment where our trio was. He approached them immediately, excited to spend time with Tsunade and Naruto in that order. What are you three doing here? He inquired. We were having a good time. What are you doing here? I just left Sensei's and decided I needed a nightcap. Naruto, I must warn you. Don't bother, the Sandame already has. Everyone treats her as if she's going to eat their children. Maybe she earned it, maybe not. But she's been good to me, minus the stabbing, he said quietly. You don't know her like I do. We were on the same team for years. You should listen to me, Naruto. I only have your best interests in mind. That's fine, whatever, I prefer to judge people for myself, and if something feels wrong, I'll handle it. You can't handle it, Naruto. This isn't some second-rate Kiri swordsman. She could have plans within plots and you'd never know until it was too late. She's twisted, she always has been. Just come on the road with me. I trained your father, I certainly can train you. He ignored Tsunade's scoff and waited for Naruto's response. I don't fight like my father, and from what I've learned, I'm nothing like him. I just don't think you're the best sensei for me. It's not personal. 
Isn't it personal that you'd rather be taught by that sick monster than your own godfather? You're my godfather, Naruto asked, surprised, and wondering why his mother hadn't said anything. Yes, and I'm sorry I wasn't there for you, I won't make excuses, but give me a chance to make this right. We can go on the road, and I can show you more than the snake ever could, Jiraiya said, his jealousy resurfacing. The old man isn't pulling me off my team, I wouldn't be able to continue taking missions with them if I left, and he said it was critical that I do. We have missions available, Naruto, but I wouldn't be with my team, I need to stay in sync with my team, so I have to stay here. Also, the old man made a decision, and I agreed to it, I don't back down on my word. This time you do, you have no idea how dangerous you are, and I can't understand why Sarutobai Sensei is letting this happen. Granted, he was always too soft on his favorite student, literally letting her get away with murder, but this is too far. Just pack your things, we'll leave in the morning. He's already stated that he's not leaving, Jiraiya. And that's stupid. I'm not going to let her use him. You two seem to have forgotten what she's really like. A heartless traitor who cares for no one because she can't. She's a high-functioning sociopath and the most evil bitch to ever grace the elemental nations. Tsunade had no idea why Jiraiya's words had such an impact on her. She's heard enough of this inane rant to be able to ignore it, but this time she can't. He needs to be made aware of some things, and then he might finally stop talking. Do you mind if I tell you a short story, Naruto? Tsunade, we don't have time for this. You intruded on us, Jiraiya, and I didn't ask you to shut up now, she said, an edge to her voice noticeable. Sure, Naruto replied. There once was a little girl. She lost her parents early in life, and it left a lasting scar. She also didn't think like everyone else. Morality and social norms around deviance didn't make sense to her. But she was also a genius, so much so that she attracted the attention of the Hakage to be on his genin cell along with the princess of the village and the town jester. Oh, but there's more to this story. The team was poison. The genius despised the jester, the jester despised the genius, and both craved the recognition of the wise and powerful old man. The team would manage to stay together, fight many battles, and even a war. They were young then, barely in their twenties when they received the titles that would cement them as the most legendary team of ninja to ever exist. Fearing what people would say, the man begged the genius to get rid of the child, pleading that he didn't want to lose his real family. Hurt, though she'd never show it, the genius went to the princess to do just that. Three months later, she was now under the charge of a sick, twisted, and bitter cripple. It wouldn't be long before the princess left, having lost the last of her clan. Tsunade, Shizune, and Naruto left the bar after hearing her story. Jiraiya hadn't moved but appeared stunned by what Tsunade had said. Naruto was curious about something as the three of them returned to Orochimaru's. So, you and Orochimaru were friends. I think I'm as close to that as she'd allow anyone to be. But it's not a simple relationship, and how she shows she cares is a little unconventional. Tsunade explained. What exactly do you mean? When I first left the village with Shizune, I was a mess, depressed and quickly succumbing to alcoholism and a gambling addiction. I don't know if I wanted to be completely numb or just hurt myself through debasement, but I was hardly functional and Shizune was taking care of me more than I was truly training her. That lasted for about a year before Orochimaru found me. She Tsunade stopped laughing, she. What exactly happened? Three months later, she found me and we fought. Well, sparred. Sparred for us. With your antics, you destroyed a forest, Shizune interjected. Hey, I appreciate her concern, but no one ever threatens me, so we had a little scuffle. Last good fight I've had, honestly. Come, no, Tsunade Sama. You two are reckless and will destroy everything. But it'll be fun. Oh, and that reminds me, brat, you need to find someone your level who enjoys fighting, not necessarily a rival because those relationships tend to turn bitter. I don't know many people who could fit the bill, and the ones I can think of don't particularly like me. Did you have Naruto-kun in mind? Rock Lee, Neji Hyuga, and Sasuke Uchiha. Oh, yeah. People take maiming, attempted murders, and failure to achieve their life goals personally, Shizun offered, helpfully but slurred. Do they? Naruto jokingly inquired. Shizune nodded before confirming, they do. And it doesn't even matter why. Both the blonde and redhead snickered at Shizune's sincerity. While walking back to Orochimaru's, Naruto reflected on Tsunade's words. True, as far as Teijutsu is concerned, Neji, Rock Lee, and Sasuke could all push him. They most likely had skills superior to his own, or in Sasuke's case, skills augmented by the predictive abilities of his Sharingan. Shikamaru and Shino were neither heavy fighters. They could certainly handle themselves, but they preferred to be several steps ahead of their opponents, leading them into traps within traps. Naruto could think ahead a few steps, especially when previous experience was factored in. 
but he wasn't the strategist his teammates were. It's what made sparring with them so entertaining. He had to be unpredictable and improvise in ways that threw their plans off. Naruto was lost in his thoughts and didn't realize he'd arrived at his destination until he heard Tsunade knock on the door. Kabuto led the trio into Orochimaru's first story office. The manor appeared to be two stories but had two sublevels as well. There were three other people in the room with her when they arrived, including a tall boy in his late teens with white hair and two red dots over his brows. Two adolescent females, one in her mid-teens with pinkish red hair and the other between the ages of 12 and 13 with red hair and eyes similar to Naruto's. So, this jerk is our clan's leader. I don't see it, said the older girl. What? exclaimed Naruto. Tsunade used medical ninjutsu to force Naruto to sober up, and the heir of the Yuzumaki was able to engage with his new clansmen. Teuya had a bad temper, so he quickly learned not to take anything personally. She was only concerned with Orochimaru, but she was also funny, direct, and honest, all of which Naruto appreciated. Karin was intriguing. She was mostly quiet and pleasant until something set her off, at which point she'd explode. Teuya took pleasure in setting her off. As the three Uzumaki talked all night, Naruto discovered that Teuya was a Jinjutsu expert who also had some cool summons she could control with her flute. Karin was an expert in medical ninjutsu and research. She was born in Kyusa, but her mother and she were mistreated there, and she was eventually saved by Orochimaru. Naruto attempted to include the older boy, Kimamero as Naruto learned his name was, but he was terse and didn't seem interested, so Naruto let him be. Overall, it was an interesting evening getting to know his fellow clan members, even if it came at the expense of a full night's sleep. Tsunade informed Orochimaru that she'd told Naruto about Team Haruzen's history, including her past with the Sandam. While the Yuzumaki were getting to know each other, she described how Juria appeared stunned, as if he couldn't process the information. Orochimaru didn't mind that Tsunade spilled the beans on something that would be considered highly personal to almost anyone else. It not only made Haruzen and Juria look bad in Naruto's eyes, but it may also cause a schism between the Toad Sage and the Old Man. Tsunade was defending her, after all. Tsunade's position on the issue has been discussed with her for a long time. Tsunade cannot, or refuses to believe, that she would have made the same decisions if it hadn't been for the fallout from their team. Orochimaru doesn't feel guilty about anything, but she doesn't like how Tsunade accepts responsibility for her actions. She did what she did because it was something she wanted to do. She isn't some broken little girl who hurries and broke. That will never be acceptable to her. She also doesn't want to be yet another thing Tsunade blames herself for. It's a wonder she manages to get out of bed at all. It's unhealthy and restrictive. On this issue, the two have never and will never agree. It is the only thing they vehemently disagree on, aside from their ethics on human experimentation. Tsunade's Hayori, too. Haruzen is certain that there are pleasant ways to begin the day. Granted, he hasn't had a particularly pleasant start to any day in years. It's always something, always something. It would be bad enough if the letter he received from Rasa was the entire thing. Because his counterpart is clearly a sadistic asshole upstart in need of a beating. Rasa finally responded to a request for assistance in the upcoming AIM invasion, and he agreed to do so under certain conditions. Haruzen realized the man would try to get something out of this, and that the fact that it was for their mutual benefit would not be enough to motivate him to act. But why is this the case? Rasa wishes to witness the fight that should have been the Chunin exam's finals, Gara vs. Naruto, Jinchuriki vs. Jinchuriki. He also wants this pointless dick measuring exercise to take place in Tsuna so that his boy has as much of an advantage as possible. Haruzen could have safeguards in place, ensuring Juria was present with seals to subdue either of them. However, they are Jinchuriki, and things can get out of hand. Haruzen did not see the value in it because there is a real risk of serious, permanent injury. But he'd have to put his trust in Naruto to handle it because Tsuna's help reduced the risk for his own shinobi and gave them more manpower. Yes, that would have been enough to ruin his day, but he also had the misfortune of sitting across from a clearly hungover Juria who appeared depressed, angry, and confused. It was bad enough that he stumbled in, tense Haruzen's ANBU, but the large man just sat down and hadn't said anything. Haruzen, who was used to his students' quirks, knew that this happens when Juria is getting ready to have a conversation he'd rather avoid. He was trying to find his nerve, and if he followed the pattern, the first thing he said would be crass and inappropriate. So, Sensei, have you impregnated any students recently? And there it was. Haruzen ordered his ANBU to leave immediately, refusing to do so in front of an audience. He trusted them, but only to a point. Not recently. Juria, the old boy doesn't get around as much as he used to. But you did get around, the professor was very smooth. 
Juria, I'm going to need you to get to the point because I have actual work and something important we need to talk about. I think it's important that you toyed with your student and then sent her to your lunatic rival. Not to you, Juria. Every one of her accomplishments was taken as a personal slight by you. Blame me if you must, in my alleged favoritism. But you burned the bridge between you two, so you'll forgive me if I find this a little hypocritical, especially from a super pervert. Alleged favoritism. You deny it even now. No, I'm just tired of having to confront it. I'm not perfect, far from it. I've been a professional killer longer than you've been alive. I mess up. I think too highly of myself. I'm flawed, Juria. No, I'm just tired of having to confront it. I'm not perfect, far from it. I've been a professional killer longer than you've been alive. I mess up. I think too highly of myself. Until you'd had your fill and discarded her. Yes, I didn't realize Danzo was as twisted as he'd become. But I needed some distance for the sake of my marriage and to manage my own guilt, so I reassigned her and limited contact. And before you go on, yes, I've often wondered if how I handled things led her to do what she did. It was one of the reasons I couldn't kill her and let her flee. I often wonder which I regret more, crossing that line with her or what I did with. I'm not sure why I'm here, sensei. I guess since Tsunade told me, I've been thinking about how things could have been different if I hadn't been so jealous and the like. Maybe she would have stayed on the straight and narrow. Perhaps, Juria, this is a question I've frequently had to ask myself. Does this change things for you? No, whatever the reason, what she's done is unconscionable, and I want her away from Naruto as soon as possible. But it does add some context. Not enough to excuse her behavior, but I feel I might understand her a little better, he shrugged. Now, what business do you need to tell me? Rasa demands that Naruto fight Gara as a condition for him to support us against the Akatsuki. I'm not ashamed to admit that I wanted to watch the fight. Did you feel let down when Naruto failed the Chunin exams? No, it was the correct decision, but Gara had the best opportunity to push Naruto, and he weren't exactly forthcoming with his skills, so I know very little of what he can do. He was supposed to be your apprentice, you were supposed to find out, Haruzen said, dismissively. I thought I was supposed to babysit and play bodyguard, if I really trained the kid. He'd run through the finals, which he did anyway. I never told you not to train him seriously, Sandame replied. He hadn't done so. No, you just said you were worried about his maturity and didn't think he was ready to advance. And just so you know, I've been preoccupied with Orochimaru and the Akatsuki. But we'll have that conversation soon, old man. So you teach him the Rasengan? The sand name asked, ignoring the latter statement. I had no idea the kid would get it in a month, neither Kakashi nor I could have done it that quickly. That must have stung, Haruzen said with a smile, like a bitch and a half. At least his father was an adult before he started showing me up. Juria said, sulking the entire time. Of course, you'll go there with him in case things get out of hand. Of course, the clang of blunted Tanto meeting each other rang throughout the private training ground. The smaller combatant was giving it his best but against a practiced opponent, he was finding himself wanting. The pressure of the assault was unrelenting, suffocating and forbade any thought. He could only react and react and react, never open to taking the initiative. It was frustrating, infuriating. It was. It was. Troublesome, Shikamaru said, as he rolled out of the way of the blade aimed at his neck, only to receive a kick to the ribs for his effort. He was in a simple outfit of black shirt and black pants, his chunin jacket long since discarded. The kick made him realize what a mistake that was. He continued his roll until he got back to his feet, to see his opponent already on him. It was with the barest of margins he was able to block. What the rookie Chunin had not be prepared for was for his attacker's free hand to grab the wrist of the hand holding his tanto and slip into his guard. Before he could make sense of her movements, he was elbowed in the face, causing him to drop his weapon. Next, he felt his arm wrenched behind and above him, causing him to bend over as she kept his arm perfectly straight. He was not given time to dwell on the pain in his shoulder as a fist to the face dropped him to the ground. Troublesome, he said, rolling to his back. Getting your ass kicked generally is, sweetie, Yoshino said. Shikamaru had no response for this. He wanted to complain but he constantly reminded himself that he asked for this. He recalls how powerless he felt in the forest of death, how Naruto did his best to ensure their safety and then willingly marched toward his doom. Shikamaru hated that feeling. His intellect was rendered a non-factor, irrelevant. Nothing he could think of would have helped in the slightest. That was the gap between Orochimaru and them so he watched as his teammate crossed swords with someone he had no hope of defeating, only to get stabbed in the end. Now, with what is coming he knows he has to be more than he is. It isn't enough to be able to plan things 20 steps ahead against people that can blow up your strategies with overwhelming power and skill. 
he could have been forced to watch a teammate die and been no more useful than a blunted kunai. He resolved to never let that be the case again. You know what your problem is? Yoshino asked. She was shocked when her son requested she help him train as she knew his father was handling his development in clan techniques but she was happy he seemed to be taking things more seriously. Seeing he wasn't going to answer she continued. It's taking you too long to get where you need to be. You keep thinking you can warm up in a fight or flip a switch to get serious when you really need to. That might work as a genin, with a jounin leading you and a jinchuriki at your back. Not as a chunin and certainly not in war. You aren't going to get breaks to craft your next plan. You'll have to constantly be moving, fighting, defending while creating your intricate strategies. It's a drag but you're right. I'll have to think more like that troublesome redhead. What do you mean? Asked Yoshino. He's good at coming up with tactics on the fly. Not surprising, his parents were like that as well. You knew his parents. Yes, but not well. His mother was teased a lot as a kid and kept her social circle small because of it so not a lot of us could say we knew her well. And his father was extremely kind but also very private. Who was his father and does Naruto know? I can't tell you and yes, he does. Troublesome. At the Aburane compound Shino was being watched by his father. The two stood in silence, the son continually stabbing his size into the wood dummy, and his father content to watch for flaws in his form. Shino started working on these for the Chunin exam finals but his match with the puppeteer didn't lend itself to close quarters combat. He, too, lamented his inability to aid Naruto against the once traitor. A hive functions best when all can contribute to the embetterment of the whole but he was unable to do so. It left him with a feeling of shame. His parents tried to tell him his feelings, while understandable, were illogical. He stood no chance of defeating the once traitor and could have done very little to alter the outcome. He'd acknowledged their words and the validity of their argument but it did little to quell his emotions. Naruto is strong, the strongest of the three of them. Neither he nor Shikamaru would challenge that but their teammate has never lorded it over them. He never discounts their contributions or tries to invoke his seniority in an attempt to diminish them. He has relied on them, their skills and talents but when he needed them the most they were impotent. Useless is something he'd never felt before and something he wishes to avoid ever feeling again. So, he resolved to better himself, to diversify his skill set while sharpening himself. He would not be the weak link, he would not be a spectator. But progress is a slow process, so for now, he'd simply focus on handling the weapons in his hands with every ounce of precision he could muster. She sometimes forgot when Asuma was properly motivated he was a damn good shinobi, and somehow she'd managed to motivate him. They'd train and spar before he met his team for the day and she hadn't been pushed like that in some time. She wouldn't say she'd gotten lazy but she had gotten content, maintaining her skills instead of pushing. Jounin were the elite but even among them there were levels. She needed to be a legitimately elite Jounin. Her students needed her to be so. Especially Naruto. It was hard being his sensei, not because of what he contained. She wasn't a small-minded fool but for reasons completely divorced from that. It was difficult to separate how he was on missions, calm, almost detached and focused, with the borderline shy nine-year-old that commissioned her to talk about Jinjutsu. She remembered how cute he was, his face still retaining his baby fat. He'd become a seasoned shinobi since then and it had taken a bit for him to warm up to his team. When he finally did, she realized he was the same good-natured boy just one that kid behind a facade to those he didn't trust. Her second concern was simply, she wasn't sure how much she truly had to teach him. His chakra control was decent, excellent given his reserves, but not fine enough for Jinjutsu. She wasn't a ninjutsu type so had very little to offer someone that could use all five nature releases. Stealth, to some extent but his summons had taken care of a good portion of that. He was ready to be a chunin when she got him and felt a little lost but they managed to figure it out. Now, however, he was marked by the Akatsuki and by Orochimaru. Kirinai was honest enough to know she'd be of minimal use against either threat as she was. Asuma understood her concern. He'd been around elite shinobi his entire life and understood feeling inadequate. He'd been helping her perfect his nature releases, fire and earth along with polishing up her teijutsu and kenjutsu as she hadn't wielded her kodachi in some time. She was also taking a page from Naruto's book, trying to create more original Jinjutsu, something people hadn't seen and couldn't just cast off. When it was time to remove the Akatsuki she promised herself she'd be ready and if she needed to fight Orochimaru to save her student, she'd be ready for that. He never questioned his mistress, it was not his place. She spoke her will and he carried it out. Theirs was a simple relationship. However, when he first laid eyes on the redhead she was so taken with, he had to admit he was filled with doubts, concerns that said boy was not worth his mistress's attention. 
As if she knew, she arranged for them to spar and while he never took opponents lightly he still held little hope for the boy. Tim Amaro could admit when he'd been wrong and he misjudged this Naruto. The spar started with Teijutsu and the smaller boy quickly learned not to kick someone with the dead bone pulse in the leg, though he recovered quickly. The exchanges were fast, both boys using agility, reaction time and spacing to deflect and slip their blows. Tim Amaro initially disregarded the other boy's tactic of kicking him in the calf, instead of the outside of the leg that typical leg kicks targeted. That is, until he started to slow down and wasn't able to put as much pressure on his legs. The boy had been wearing him down, the accumulated damage had taken its toll but even still, Kimimaro had gotten the better of their fight. Naruto was worse off, a bloody lip is all that remained of the visible damage as his bruises healed swiftly but he was breathing heavily. Kimimaro admitted to himself that Naruto was a tank, taking hits some of the sound five couldn't endure and keep going. A small part of him was having fun curious what an all-out fight between the two would look like. Orochimaru-sama called a short break before she had them engage with Kenjutsu, and Kimimaro saw immediately that the redhead was a much better swordsman as he pushed the older boy in what he, Kimimaro, would consider his best skill. The duel was fast but Kimimaro could tell Naruto was attempting to incorporate some new elements. It hadn't been quite mastered yet but when it was the Uzumaki would be a nightmare. His speed and power were excellent but his, nascent, ability to transition from a downward slash to a thrust to a horizontal slash with just a change in his grip and wrist movement was impressive. Once mastered he'd flow through defenses as he'd either be too fast or too hard to predict for most to stop his offense. Once Orochimaru called a halt to their fight, she informed them this would be a daily occurrence until the month was over and Kimimaro went back to Odo. Both boys acknowledged her words and Kimimaro was dismissed for the day choosing to shower, change and then explore the village for a bit. All Naruto impressed him, he doubted most of the rest of this trash would. The village was too open for him, the general mood didn't seem befitting of a Shinobi village. Civilians all about, concerned about very little and generally in the way, as far as he was concerned. Kimimaro wasn't used to this kind of atmosphere. Odo only had people who were of use to his Orochimaru-sama and before that he spent his time in a cell, like an animal. He had to stop himself from thinking about his time with his clan. It always angered him and anger would do him no good. They were all dead so it didn't matter. As he traversed the village he started to notice a shadow tailing him. Deciding against playing coy, he called it out to see a panther cub emerge and trot up to him. Hi, why are you following me? Onii-chan said you might want some company since you didn't know anyone in Kanoha residence can be jerks. The trash of this village does not concern me. He said before turning around and continuing his walk and noticed the cub walked right alongside him. You can return to your summoner. I'm good, she said, not taking the hint. Tim Amaro relented, figuring she'd be content to travel in silence. Me? Yeah. He was wrong. Yes? What do you do for fun? Fun? I'm a warrior. I don't concern myself with fun. That's stupid, the cub said. That is not stupid, it is dedication. Oni I chan is dedicated and he still has fun. He plays ninja with some village kids and myself. The Uzumaki is not without skill but he'd be better if he spent that time training. PFFT, he could totally kick your ass in a real fight. She said and then looked panicked when Kimimaro shot her a glare. He assumed it was the glaring that caused her reaction. Don't tell Nyai-chan I said a bad word, okay. He was wrong again. I'll consider it. He said, causing the summons to relax. He was curious why she was so concerned with the Yuzumaki finding out about her word choice but decided it was of little concern. We should get some lunch, I know the perfect place. Fine, Kimimaro said and followed the cub to a small stand. That served ramen. He learned the cub's name was Magula and she apparently came to the stand a lot, enough to have a tab and be known by the chefs. Chuchai and Aim were some of the few people to treat Naruto decently so he ate at the stand a lot, as a consequence Magula did as well. They didn't even hesitate to feed nor speak with her as if were an everyday occurrence. He paid little attention to the exchange until the expressive cub called him her Onii Nu Chan's friend. If he were one to do so, he would have snorted. He could respect the Uzumaki but friends. Jugo was his only friend. He didn't see the need in another however the ramen chef seemed excited and offered him a free bowl and thanks. Their gratitude mirrored Jugo's own and Kimimaro was curious why it was of note that he'd be friends with, though he wasn't, the redhead. Granted, he knew very little of the Uzumaki's life. He never considered asking and assumed his mistress would give him all the information he needed. Now, he was curious. He offered to pay for the meal but the chefs declined, saying Naruto leaves a balance in case Magula stops by so it was covered. He decided to return, having seen enough of the village and the small summons was right beside him. 
letting his curiosity get the better of him. Kimimaro was forced to ask, why did those chefs find it noteworthy I'm friends with Naruto? The villagers weren't very nice to him, many still aren't. They treat him like he isn't there or, at the very least, like they wish he weren't. Almost no one wanted to befriend him so he was alone a lot before he joined us Panthers. Then he was happy because he had friends. Interesting Kimimaro thought but said nothing else as the pair walked back to the manor. As Kimimaro was gone to explore the village, Orochimaru was continuing her training of her latest apprentice. She couldn't let go of the feeling he was hiding something significant from her, and without knowing the full extent of his abilities she may be covering things he already knows instead of advancing him with new knowledge. It was time she got a full picture of what he could do. Having her snakes bind him was just to help loosen his lips. You're holding back on me, Naruto-kun. How he said intelligently. Granted, he was but how did she know that? If I'm going to train you properly I really need to know all you can do. Tai and Kenjutsu I know and you'll be at a higher level by the time we attack the Akatsuki but I know ninjutsu is your strongest skill so what are you hiding? Um, just a few things but they are my trump cards. Also, the old man's ANBU is always watching and I don't want him to know, Naruto said. Seemingly, she approved of the sentiment as she had her snakes release him. As she released him the ANBU appeared before them. You have no reason to fear my reporting your skills to the Sandam. My orders were to protect you, not monitor you especially as your original techniques all fall under clan techniques until stated otherwise. The ANBU swiftly disappeared after that. See, now, please, Naruto-kun what have you been holding back? Well, first, I developed a yin release technique but I only have one. It's an illusion. Please demonstrate it. She said and watched as he hesitated before following her orders. Four hand seals later and she saw a flash of light and then her world turned black. The only source of color was a red moon and Naruto's red hair. However, his hair was longer, flowing down to the ground and had become black at its ends. It kept growing until the ends became panthers, all coming from her. It surprised her when she felt actual pain from the bites and it took a considerable flare to end the illusion. I call that my hunter's moon technique. Impressive. Similar to Tabarama's bringer of darkness. But that isn't all, is it? No. You should probably come by me, though. My control with this isn't where I'd like it to be. Orochimaru quirked an eyebrow but did as her student requested. He then promptly performed eight hand seals and slammed his hand on the ground. She couldn't hear his vocalization but didn't have to wait long for the jutsu to emerge. Forty feet from them, she saw something amazing. Unbelievable really. It rushed from the ground and spread to the sky. Even as far away as she was she could feel the heat. She could only stare at her apprentice. He'd, seemingly, done the impossible. H. How? She asked and he bashfully scratched the back of his head. His natural affinities are wind and water. She knows that for a fact, Kabuto is the best at what he does. It's really just phases of matter. Once you understand that, the trick just becomes molding the chakra. No big deal, really. The two senior ninja bearing witness to this couldn't have disagreed more vehemently. Itachi now understood why Naruto wanted to keep this secret. Orochimaru was simply beyond pleased. It seems she has something to learn from her student. She, of course, wasted no time relaying how delighted she was. If you were older Naruto-kun, I'd have you right here and now until you begged for mercy twice. I've never begged for anything a day in my life. He retorted. Twice, she didn't seem to care. What do you call that, by the way? It's my lava style, burning geyser. It was another team training session for Team 7 and the clear blue sky did not reflect the mood of the team. The Uchiha had changed recently. He'd lost his spark. It was obvious to every member of the team. His drive all but gone, everything he did was by rote, his body moving through the motions. Sekiro was no help, as her history of trying to befriend, ensnare, console the last Uchiha always ended in failure. He dismissed her out of hand if it wasn't about missions. Sasuke respected Kakashi, as much as Sasuke respected anyone but still could draw no comfort nor inspiration from the man. He was too remote, contrasting Sekura's extreme openness. Sasuke was the acknowledged leader of their pack but he was faltering and Kiba, his partner, could do little to help either. He'd taken the secondary position so any challenge levied now would seem impotent. He'd given up being a true challenge early in their formation. Akamaru was concerned. If the team didn't function well his partner was at risk which meant he was at risk. He didn't fully understand why the Uchiha had lost his motivation but it negatively affected all. He never liked the Uchiha, there was an omnipresent darkness in him. It had been focused and intense. While it's lost its intensity, the lack of focus makes it a possible contagion. Would he bring the rest of the team down as he believed his emotions were somehow deeper than anyone else's? Would he turn violent as his depression gave way to anger? Akamaru didn't know and the elders of his pack had very little to say on the matter. 
He was powerless to change things and could only be diligent in protecting his partner. It was all he could do. Then in hopes someone could reach the boy before he sunk in on himself completely or lashed out at others. Neither were ideal and both would be a waste of potential. Come on, Akamaru, let's show Sasuke what's what, Kiba said with forced enthusiasm. Akamaru heeded his call all the same. The spar would likely have the same results they always did but even if Kiba did win he'd take no pride in it and Sasuke would feel no shame. This team was going nowhere fast. Of all the ways she had planned to spend her evening, having a civil discussion with Juria was nowhere on the list. He claimed he'd come with important news concerning Naruto, so of course she prepared for another screed on how she was going to corrupt him and make him experiment on babies and kick puppies in her attempt to take over the world. She was in no mood and Naruto was kind enough to make dinner for everyone, including his fellow Yuzumaki, Kimamero, Majila and Kabuto and she'd rather not miss that as it smelled divine. Now the two sat in her parlor, each in a lather chair staring at the other. Make it quick, she said, neutrally. The Keisgage is hinging his support with the Akatsuki on Naruto fighting Gara and Suna. Sensei has agreed and will leave at month's end. Maybe Sensei should tell Rasa he'll help or I'll kill him myself. Oh, yes, the Orochimaru school of diplomacy. When in doubt, hold a sword to someone's throat. Juria said dismissively. What's wrong with holding a sword to someone's throat? A lot gets accomplished by holding a sword to someone's throat. Well, as fun as this is let me inform the brat so we can come up with a plan. No, he'll be fine. Gara holds no challenge for him currently. I wasn't asking. Orochimaru narrowed her eyes. You keep at this Juria and you won't like the consequence. You think you can keep me from my godson. You overestimate yourself. Sensei managed it and you didn't even put up a fight. I'm confident I can achieve similar results if you push me. To think I felt bad after Tsunade's little story. You're just a bottomless void. I'm more certain than ever you belong nowhere near Naruto. And yet he lives with me and is being trained by me because he trusts me. No, because you plotted and schemed to make it happen. You may be getting away with this now but it won't last forever. Leave, Jiraiya. Fine, I'll be back tomorrow to speak with Naruto. He said and made his way to the front door. She just rolled her eyes at the lifelong idiot. She joined the rest in the dining room where Naruto and Karin were just bringing out dinner. She was never one to enjoy group meals but she had to admit seeing everyone talking and laughing, especially at Majila's retelling of her time with Kimamero. It was much more relaxed than Odo, though she realized it's because she terrified everyone, giving the impression she was mercurial to the extreme. Good to keep a bunch of rogues in line, bad for dinner conversation. She paid special attention to her newest student and how he seemed to draw everyone in. He wasn't put off by Teuya's language, could get Karin to open up and even a stoic like Kimimaro was willing to engage. She knew he was something special but mostly she focused on his potential as a shinobi. It was comforting to know she had chosen correctly and it was time to start moving things along. As the others cleared the table, Naruto was headed to the library, Majila underfoot, to do some studying but Orochimaru had different plans. Naruto-kun, she said. Yes, Shishu, we need to discuss another part of your regimen, namely recovery. Recovery, yes, while most experienced ninja know to rest and some even visit hot springs occasional to relax their muscles, most don't pay enough attention to post-workout recovery. It limits their gains as they aren't taking care of their bodies. I won't let you make that same mistake so take a hot bath and then go to your bedroom. You'll be receiving a massage afterward to make sure there's no tension in your muscles. The redhead simply nodded and headed toward the bathroom nearest his bedroom. After his soak, Naruto returned to his room to see it alight with candles and the smell of incense burning. He also saw a massage table and laid on high, face down. He had not suspected the person to give him the massage to be Orochimaru herself as he tensed when he noticed her presence. This only caused her to laugh as she told him to relax. It was weird. Outside of sparring Naruto wasn't accustomed to much in the way of physical contact so even ordinary acts to most people felt intimate to him so this was doubly so. Orochimaru paid attention to his initial discomfort. Part of the reason she chose to do this was to get him used to her touch so she wouldn't have to later. Also, it was a chance to make him start seeing her as an object of affection and not just a teacher as he had clearly labeled Kiranai. She started at his legs and methodically worked her way up. He did have a great deal of tension in his muscles and knots to work out so it wasn't completely manipulative. 60 over 40 she'd wager. By the time she'd gotten to his back he'd relaxed completely, no doubt in part to the incense which were made of a little something extra. It'd also, most likely, give him an interesting dream tonight.
He was asleep before she finished, leaving her to place him in bed. She watched as he slept peacefully. Truly, he was beautiful in her eyes. Not just aesthetically, though she reasoned he'd be quite attractive when he matured instead of just boyishly cute now but it was his potential and drive she saw. It was similar to Juria. When they were kids she'd seen his potential that was just begging to be unleashed. If he had not been a jealous, petty boy she'd have continued to be interested in him. Naruto would be greater still and hold none of Jiria's inferiorities. He broke the rules of ninjutsu and apparently had been working on his lava release for almost two years, all in secret. Ice release as well, after seeing it in action during a mission. Phases of matter she remembers him saying. Simple in conception not execution but he was right. If you can make water vapor and viscous liquids then ice should be possible. If you can make earth, mud and stone then lava should be possible. She, like others, assumed only bloodlines could truly wield the sub-elements but she was wrong. Because no one was there to tell him he couldn't, Naruto truly believes chakra is limitless potential. Energy to be manipulated and he'll go farther than any before him. That, she believed, was his beauty. Until she was around him, exposed to him. He has a lightness to him, one that shouldn't be there. He's within his rights to hate much of the village or simply deem life unfair and not care about anything but he doesn't. She's seen him genuinely enjoy others. She was drawn to it even if it'd be something she'd seek to quash, bend or otherwise eliminate from others. But with him, she'd protect it as she sees that quality and his potential is intrinsically linked. His belief in chakra mirrors his belief in himself and his innate optimism. Not naivete but true optimism that he can improve things if he doesn't give up. It's intoxicating, so much so she has to remind herself not to rush things. He's still too young so she must be patient and she will but one day Naruto Uzumaki will be hers and hers alone. Even if she has to burn the rest of the world to make it happen. Not Jiria, not Haruzen, no one will stop her. She gives Naruto a small kiss on the cheek and departs, knowing more is in store once he gets old enough. She just has to wait. A dark forest illuminated by the waxing crescent. The foliage is familiar, the dewy scents are as well. His only question is how he got here. Well, and where he got these clothes. Over a mesh-lined black shirt was some red armor he'd never seen before. Over that he was wearing a black Hayori with red and blue flames at the bottom. He can't see it but a red Yuzumaki swirl lies at the center of his back. His sword is strapped to his back and he has his kunai holsters strapped to each leg. His black pants, strapped with crimson tape at the ankles and his black shinobi sandals finish the look. He has no more time to think about his clothing as a tidal wave comes toward him, uprooting the trees in its way. He wastes no time performing a series of hand seals and immediately unleashes a strong blast of wind, one powerful enough to cleave the tidal wave in two, splitting so none of the water hits him. In the distance he sees a figure running toward him with great speed. As the figure gets closer, he sees the glow of Raten Chakra contained in some type of blade. Finally, he can make out the figure, it's Tabarama Senju and he's wielding the Rage in no Ken. Naruto sprinted toward the Hakage with great speed himself, able to perform the full Shukuchi without any ill effects. Tabarama readied himself, bringing his lightning blade overhead, preparing to deliver a powerful strike. Naruto draws his blade, smooth and without mistake, coating it with his supersonic chakra. The two blades meet in the middle and neither give way to the other. Naruto placed his left hand on the hilt, now gripping with both as Tabarama is much stronger than him but that will be to his benefit. Naruto spun, allow Tabarama's forward momentum to carry him forward while tries to horizontally slash his back but the Senju was more than ready for that and swiftly blocked the strike with his own blade. Naruto jumped back to give himself some space and the two combatants eyed each other. Without a word to the two re-engaged but there were few sword clashes, their dance performed in near-perfect silence. He was the better technical swordsman but technique can be overwhelmed by physical superiority and experience, something the Nidame had in spades. This was leaving Naruto on the defensive more than he would like but it couldn't be avoided. He knew he had to be patient, to find a true opening and exploit it for all it's worth. It took a few moments but he finally saw it, a hole in Tabarama's offense. Naruto promptly charged forward with a thrust of his blade, the speed surprising the former Hakage, and just as Naruto was about to score a blow Tabarama vanished. Hurishin the redhead thought and swiftly turned to where he believed the follow-up attack would come, bringing his sword down. He was met with a clang but it was not Tabarama's Raijin that stopped his blade but a tri-pointed kunai. Blue eyes met blue eyes as Naruto stood in front of one of his long-time idols and his father, Minato Namikaze. Without preamble the Yandame went for a leg sweep and Naruto jumped back. It was a mistake as the Yandame kicked him whilst he was in midair causing the smaller Yuzumaki to fly back and roll until he got back to his feet. 
Minato launched three of his signature kunai and Naruto knew he'd be overwhelmed if they got near him so he tried something, an experiment he hadn't perfected yet. He coated his blade with his supersonic chakra flow and swung his blade, creating blades that flew through the air. He managed to sever the shiki of two of the kunai but missed the one, his control over the technique failing at some point. The kunai landed beside him and he jumped forward, turning to face the opposite direction, hoping he predicted right. He didn't. He tried to swing his blade where he thought his father might flash to but he guessed wrong and was punched in the stomach for his trouble. The hit was hard enough to make him drop his blade and Naruto shunchened away but another tri-tip kunai was in hot pursuit. Naruto landed on a tree branch, one of the few not taken out by the Nidame's water jutsu. To his dismay as soon as he landed he heard a thud. On instinct he sent a great deal of chakra to his left hand, turning toward his right. Rasengan met Rasengan as father and son battled for dominance. Minato eventually released his and grabbed Naruto's wrist with the same hand. Before he could think Naruto was no longer on a tree but hanging over a cliff. He looked up to his father, who was dangling him and the man smiled before releasing Naruto's wrist and letting him fall. It was darker, he could see nothing but black as not even the moonlight penetrated. His fall felt never-ending until he landed on something soft. He was on a bed and in a room with sporadic spots of candlelight. The scent was familiar but he couldn't quite recall what it was but he was very comfortable. He decided to close his eyes. The two former Hokage had pushed him hard and he needed to rest. Hyukuku he heard the familiar laugh and shot up, turning to see his new sensei in a dark red kimono. Her nail polish matched the color of the kimono and he could see a faint trace of lipstick. Her hair was pulled back in a loose bun and the candle light accented the complexion of her skin nicely. She was, in short, beautiful, desirable in a way Naruto hadn't thought another person could be. Her sauntering over to him, pace deliberately slow didn't help matters as he saw the sway in her hips and the slip bounce of her breasts. He was feeling things he couldn't put words to, like some long-lost knowledge he couldn't quite remember, an impression he should be doing something to. With her, when she finally made it to the bed and claimed his lips, the picture became a little clearly. Acting on instinct he returned the kiss, mimicking her motions. His hands around her waist but decidedly unhappy with their lack of activity. As if they had a will of their own, they started to undo her purple obai and he felt her smile. Taking that as a cue to continue he slipped his hands in her now loosened kimono, each making the slow climb toward her breasts. He was enjoying the feel of his skin, slightly cool to the touch and wanted to savor it. Before he could reach his intended goals, she broke off the kiss and pushed him back so he was lying flat on the bed. She then mounted him, smiling as she started to slowly drop the kimono from her shoulders. So entranced he could only stare at her eyes until he realized she was topless. Daring to break eye contact his vision drifted down, once again noticing her red lips and then her slender neck. Just as he was about to lay eyes on her naked breasts he felt a thud. And then another, and another. Wake up, Oni-chan. I'm up, I'm up. Baruto near shouted, confusion and irritation warring within him. Good, it's time for training. Okay, I'll start getting ready. He said before noticing a certain stiffness which caused him to blush after I take a cold shower. Do you have an adequate wardrobe? Yes. Do you have enough water? Yes. Weapons? Yes, yes, and yes. I've had enough of everything, Naruto said, rolling his eyes in mock irritation. To be honest, he enjoyed the attention and the fact that someone cared enough about him to go to such lengths. But Tsunade and Juria's snickering was useless. Shizun regarded her little brother figure as if weighing the veracity of his words. She knows he dabbles in sealing and most likely has his equipment there, but he's going to a foreign village in the desert, so she has reason to be concerned. Oink, exclaims Tantan, squirming in Shizun's arms. I'm not going to forget, Tun Chan, Naruto said. Okay, brat, go kick some ass and see if you can get some action going, Tsunade said as he slipped him some ryo. Shizun reprimanded Tsunade-sama, and Tsunade simply waved her off. Naruto took the money and winked at her. There was no point in not supplementing his income for this idiotic mission. When Orochimaru Shishu told him he'd be fighting Gara, he was disappointed. Especially not in Tsuna, which has an abundance of sand. He still believes he can beat his Suna opponent, but he has little interest in him. Whatever Suna did to Gara, it broke him, and he's more of a maniac than a shinobi. What is the worth of defeating a beast? Naruto's team had said their farewells the night before because they had a mission to complete today. Kurenai, like Shizun, went over the list of items he needed to bring and told him to stay hydrated. Shikamaru wished him luck as he faced a series of difficulties, and Shino wished him safe travels. The person he was supposed to speak with last was the person who had been training him non-stop for the previous month. Naruto hadn't added much to his ninjutsu arsenal, but he had gotten better at using them. 
His lava and ice jutsu still took too long and lacked proper control to be field ready, but Orochimaru was confident that with time, they would improve. His mornings began with a workout followed by a spar with Kimimaro. He has grown to like the stoic boy, even if he refers to him as Akagami instead of his given name. Though, in terms of nicknames, it is fairly benign. He'd eat and then begin following Orochimaru's instructions. Above all, she was preparing him to face the Akatsuki members, and while he couldn't match their power, he could outsmart them with her knowledge of their abilities. Various scenarios were discussed for each of the known members, and some preliminary plans were developed. He'd have to learn more jutsu to deal with them, but he was confident he'd be as prepared as he could be when the time came. She'd work on his various skills after the study session, such as helping him become more comfortable with his mother's kenjutsu style or predicting behavior from body language. She even began teaching him some of her hebai style, though he'd need to become much more adaptable to fully incorporate it. That usually lasted until late afternoon, when he was free for the evening. He'd spend an hour learning from his shadow clones and the materials his mother kept in their vault, which was really just a ceiling array that could be accessed from multiple points if you knew the array, and had the right chakra signature. He'd release the resistance seals, which he only wore during the day or when training, and go visit his team or spend time with Tayuya and Karin after that. The three finally agreed on a design for their future compound, which would be near the mask storage temple. Because of the security seals Naruto planned to incorporate, as well as some other features, the construction would take some time, but it would be worth it in the end. Overall, it had been a good month. He was gaining experience and honing his abilities. Yes, everything was in order, except for the recurring sex dreams about Orochimaru. They didn't happen every night, but they became more graphic with each passing night, and making eye contact with her the next morning was extremely awkward for the Yuzumaki. He was only able to do so because he was afraid of where his traitorous eyes might wander if left to their own devices. He didn't want to irritate a Sanin, especially one who knew exactly where he slept. But, if you ignore his sexual awakening, it was a good month. I think you'll win, Orochimaru said, stroking his whiskered cheek. He fought the instinctive reaction that came with people doing that, which he hadn't realized until Shizune did it after his mission to Ishful. Ninjas who are badass do not purr. He just knew his father wouldn't, and he wouldn't either. Hello, was the hushed response. And don't get perverted with Jiraiya. Hi, she says as she ruffles his hair, confident that her apprentice will handle the Keizkij son. Well, brat, we need to go, Juria said before taking off. All right, bye everyone, Naruto exclaimed as he caught up with the Gama Sanin. Orochimaru arrived at Haruzen's office shortly after being assigned a mission. It was his explanation for why she couldn't accompany her student to Suna. She found the thought amusing until Kabuto arrived with an ANBU escort who appeared to be in bad shape. That was not amusing in the least. Former trader and former spy entered the Hokage's office, where they found Kakashi, Gai, and Asuma. Sensei, Orochimaru, we need to begin the process of establishing Odo as a true protectorate of Kanoha. I'm sending my top Jounin with you to gather the necessary information, including a full roster of your employed ninja and any projects you may have. I expect you back in a week. Is that it? Yes, leave in an hour. Hi. The group of five left, each preparing their belongings and the Jounin sensei informing their students that they would be gone for a week. Orochimaru waited until they were alone before inquiring about Kabuto's health and what had happened. He assured his mistress that it was only a routine interrogation. He wouldn't betray her for the leaf, he has no affection for the village or the man who let that monster Danzo trick his mother into trying to kill him. Konoha could never have his trust. I knew this would happen eventually, which is why I ordered Gurin to stop my current experiments. The snake Sanin said, causing Kabuto to readjust his glasses, a tick she noticed. Kabuto, speak up. I just don't understand why we had to stop working. Orochimaru-sama, we could have made some amazing discoveries. Or not, and it would jeopardize my position here for little gain. We'll pick up where we left off eventually, it's just a temporary setback. He adjusted his glasses again. What are you talking about, Kabuto? Nothing. Orochimaru-sama, I guess I was just too invested in those experiments. Uncomfortable, she said, and the two remained silent. Guy discovered his team at their usual training grounds, all three working independently. It had only been two weeks since Neji had received his prosthetic arm, but Guy could tell the boy was overjoyed. He was overjoyed because his team had been reassembled and was working harder than ever before, true young flames. What worried Guy was that they were focusing so much on a comrade, Yuzumaki Naruto, rather than an enemy nin. He realizes why. Naruto not only harmed Neji and Lee's bodies, but he also harmed their collective pride. They assumed they were the strongest genin in the village, 
and they were correct because Naruto was only a genin in name. But their defeats, maiming, and near murder are indelible in their minds. On the one hand, Guy wishes to assist them in overcoming their aversion to Naruto. He did nothing wrong by shinobi standards, and they must understand this, especially if Sandame Sama orders them to participate in the AIM invasion. They may have to collaborate with Naruto and be led by him, and there will be no time for squabbles when real enemies are on the move. It could cost them their jobs or even their lives. But another part of him wants them to keep this drive because it may leave them as prepared for what is to come as anything else. It's a fine line, and Jounin, who is normally boisterous, is at a loss for what to do. Yash, my youthful students fall in. He yelled, waiting for them to do as he said. Kai then told them about his mission to Odo and that he'd be gone for a week. He told them to keep training and that he'd see them soon. Wait, sensei, isn't Orochimaru the Uzumaki bastard's sensei coming as well? Tenten inquired. No, Naruto has been assigned another mission in Suda, and it appears that the young Keisuke wants to see the Chunin exam finals. Oh, well, I hope he doesn't get seriously hurt by that lunatic, Tenten responded. It would be a shame if such a thing happened to him, Neji added. Your intentions are unyouthful, my students, he is a comrade, and you would do well to remember that. Now I must depart, Guy said before disappearing in a swirl of leaves. Asuma was also informing his students of his impending departure, and instructing them to supplement their clan training in his absence. Telling them to train together is pointless because two of them will refuse and the third will do nothing to force the issue. His team is a shambles, and the supposed leader is becoming increasingly estranged from the rest. Hinata respects him, albeit grudgingly. He's a man enough to admit it's his fault. He was too lax when they first got together. He had his reasons, it wasn't just laziness, but given the current dynamics, he should have been more forceful from the start. With what's coming, Asuma knows there's no way his team will be activated to participate. Hinata is the only one who comes close, especially after revealing her archery skills. Such a long-term threat cannot be ignored. She has the combat skills to be a chunin, but the leadership qualities have yet to emerge, and he has no idea how to bring them out. His other charges simply need to become bloodthirsty and mature. Because none of their C ranks have gone wrong, they have a distorted view of what this life can entail, even for clan kids. He realized this during the chunin exams, but has yet to successfully transition them. He'd have to change it soon. After relaying his orders, Asuma dismissed them. Hinata, take a step back. Are you sure, Sensei? Hinata, I'll be blunt, this team is a shambles, and it's a shambles because of two of its members. Care to guess which two? The obvious answer would be Ino and Choji Kun, but I'm guessing they'd be too obvious. Yes, it's us. I should have been on you guys from the start, that's my fault, and I'll make amends when I return, but you. You should be the leader of this team, but you're content to just hang back and let the others continue on when you know better. Why? I don't want to be in charge. A fascinating position for an heiress. Neither do I want to be that. Then what do you want? Snorted Hinata. That's a great question, Sensei. Kakashi arrived at his team's training ground and watched Kiba play with Akamaru, despite the fact that it wasn't really training. Sekura sat under a tree staring at Sasuke who stared off into the distance. He sighed at his teammates. Kakashi has experienced depression. He suffered through it, fought it, and frankly felt he'd lost to it more than once, so he knows Sasuke just getting out of bed is a victory. It's almost indescribable to lose your purpose. He sympathizes with the previous Uchiha and has directed him to seek professional assistance. It hasn't been long, so there aren't many outcomes, but Sasuke didn't fight him over it, so he'll take it. Tiba would be fine. He has his family and his partner, However, Kakashi would remain vigilant so that the Inuzuka does not become one-dimensional. Sekura he had no idea what to do with Sekura. She doesn't seem to be drawn to any of the shinobi arts. Jinjutsu. She could do a few things, but did she have the creativity and subtlety required to truly excel at the art? She lacked it and refused to cultivate it. Uriyajutsu. She could do it, and her brief stint at the hospital during the Chunin exams break seemed to spark an ember, but the experienced Mednans disliked her ambivalence. They expected a certain level of zeal if you were involved in the healing arts, fair or not. Keijutsu. If he created her, and he did. Ninjutsu. He'd almost kill the kid if he pushed her too hard with her reserves. He didn't know how to push her forward because she was good for her level and her skills were solidly genin. Ma, ma, my cute genin, I have news. All three of them paused and looked at Kakashi, making no move to approach him. He'd also have to work on their discipline. Sure, he didn't really portray any, but as a former ANBU and an elite jounin, he had different rules. They'd have to earn their scorn. I've been assigned a week-long mission to Odo. Please continue with your training while I'm gone, he says, aware that the little bastards didn't even say goodbye. 
If Naruto were here, he would say his goodbyes. The two newest Yuzumaki of Konoha were walking around the village with Majila the day after Naruto and Orochimaru left. Naruto refused to take her to Suna, and she refused to return to her realm. So Karin and Teuya agreed to keep an eye on her. Karin was carrying the cub at the time. This was necessary, but Majula liked being carried and Karin liked soft, cuddly things, so it worked out. Teuya rolled her eyes at the pair but made no mention of their antics, having grown accustomed to her cousin's eccentricities. Both were probationary genin, which was appropriate for Karin but utter nonsense for Teuya. She also felt her rank was more reflective of her previous association than of her skills, but she'd let it ride for the time being. Orochimaru informed her that the old man would be replaced soon enough, so there was no need to argue about rank. She still didn't like Sandame. His portrayal of a kind grandfather felt phony and manipulative. Knowing what he did to Naruto, whom she had grown to like, only solidified her opinion of the man as someone to be wary of. The trio was looking for a place to eat, but some of the village's establishments were hostile to the two Yuzumaki, so their options were limited. Neither knew if it was the Orochimaru or Naruto connection, or some combination of the two, but it was real. Teuya considered them cowards because they were never rude enough to be called on it. If you have something to say, she believes you should say it and stand by it. The Uzumaki and Summon chose a sushi restaurant that serves them and leaves them alone, with no one batting an eye at the presence of the panther cub. There was a choice of counter service or sitting in a booth at the restaurant. The girls chose a corner booth to avoid drawing attention to themselves, which the talking animal would do anyway. The three sat down and began to eat when they were interrupted by two Konoichi. Ino Yamanaka was a slanderer. She'd admit it without hesitation. Her parents encouraged her to do so because they believed it would passively improve her information-gathering skills. The issue was that they never enforced limits or boundaries. Ino came across as a nosy busybody with no regard for other people's private information as a result of this. So when she saw two redhead Kanoichi sitting at a booth, she knew they belonged to the newly recognized clan. The clan that was led by a former classmate. But she didn't know much else and couldn't accept such a blunder. So, lacking the unearned confidence that comes with youth, Ino approached the table. Karin, being a censor, was the first to notice the two Kanoichi approaching. She didn't sense any hostility from them, but she was still uneasy around them. Teuya noticed it as well. But she kept eating, confident that if the two wanted trouble, she'd give them more than they could handle. Majula was preoccupied with her meal and seemed unconcerned about anything else. Hello, my name is Ino Yamanaka and this is Sakura Haruno. Who might you be? She introduced herself. Karin, Teuya, Majula continued to eat. Are you new to town? I haven't seen you around before. Yes, Teuya replied flatly. Where are you from originally? Ino inquired, hoping to elicit an answer. Why? Karin inquired. I just want to get to know you. We don't have many Kanoichi our age, and I was hoping you guys could be our friends. No, that will never happen, Teuya said. Why? Sekura asked for the first time, perplexed by the girl's hostility. Teuya tapped Majula on the back of the head to get her attention. Who are these ladies, Max? Teuya inquired. Oh, they were classmates with Onii Chan before he graduated ahead of them. And the blonde one told the pink one not to be his friend because he was bad. Ino and Sakura both shuddered. We haven't known Shithead for very long, but we both know enough not to associate with someone who would do that to our clansmen, Teuya rejoined. I was six years old, and I didn't know Naruto, but everyone said he was bad. I don't give a damn. Ino was stunned by the dismissal and turned to walk away in disbelief. Sekira followed her out of the restaurant, and both girls left. Ino hadn't thought about how she'd met Sekira in years, the two having had a falling out a few years ago, and only now, after graduation, had they begun to mend their broken bond. As an admitted gossip, it hadn't occurred to Ino how ignorant she'd been about Naruto until recently. She'd readily accepted the schoolyard consensus that he was a bad kid, and her academy sensei's reactions did nothing to change her mind. Not even after he graduated, despite the fact that many assumed he simply dropped out. No one thought or mentioned him until he wound up on Team 8, and learning he'd been on the reserves for three years made everyone assume he was just a dead last. Shikamaru tried to persuade her otherwise, but Ino chalked it up to him not wanting to be associated with Naruto's incompetence. After the Chunin exam prelims, Ino was astounded by Naruto's sword skills, but he hadn't been particularly impressed with his opponent, so he dismissed it. The fact that he breezed through the finals and was recognized as a clan heir piqued Ino's interest in the redhead. Shikamaru was useless, he refused to reveal anything about his teammate, and when she asked why, he simply muttered troublesome and walked away. She'd never spoken to Shino and hadn't been willing to change that, even if it meant learning dirt on someone. 
and now, as her previous childishness was thrown in her face, she'd been shut out by his clan members. Sekura's thoughts were similar to Eno's. She remembered telling the chubby-cheeked redhead not to bother her because he was a jerk. She vaguely recalls how distressed she appeared, but he never attempted to speak to her again. Even at the few joint team functions, he made no attempt to speak to her or even acknowledge her presence. She didn't mind because she was preoccupied with Sasuke. She knew Kakashi-sensei had a previous relationship with him, having mentioned Naruto a few times, but it was clear he admired the rookie Chunin. Apparently, his opinion of her was so negative that his clan members wouldn't even consider her worth knowing, if only to form their own opinion of her. That enraged her. The two Yuzumaki continued to eat with smirks on their faces. Teuya, to be honest, didn't give a damn about instances of childish groupthink. When Magula relayed the information on some of the notable girls around Naruto's age, she made it clear that while Naruto was initially hurt, he simply focused on developing himself. It wasn't some long-forgotten personal slight. He learned to not care because they didn't want to know him. Orders, on the other hand, were orders. According to Teuya's interpretation, Orochimaru-sama orders her and Karin to keep any cunt who is overly curious or openly interested away from Naruto. And she would, because, as much as she likes Naruto, she fears and respects Orochimaru-sama and would never betray her. Karin is the same way. Two days later, the Kanoha team was discovered outside the walls of Odo. Odo was intriguing because it resembled Kanoha. The buildings were not as tall, but you would never guess it was a shinobi village from the outside. That was on purpose. The true Shinobi events took place in the underground facilities, and they were numerous. Asuma was taken aback by everything. The maze of tunnels and subterranean levels was both impressive and perplexing. The Odo ninja were professional enough, but there was a palpable fear in their eyes as Orochimaru walked by. Asuma had refused to participate in this mission. Not even a smidge on. Like Juria, he had always envied his father's relationship with Orochimaru. His father praised her natural talent, almost in contrast to her criticism of Asuma's lack of it. He had no idea why his father had suddenly distanced himself from his student, but something had clearly happened. He's always felt uneasy around the Sanin, as if they were the children his father wished he'd had. It was immature and incorrect, but it was how he felt. Allowing Orochimaru to flee after her crimes only reinforced this for him. Simply put, they were held to a different standard. It was unjust and infuriating. As a result, he didn't want to be here. He didn't think he needed to be here. But when he remembered Kuranai's concerns about the Snake Sanin's plans for Naruto, he changed his mind. Deciphering Orochimaru's schemes and plots is likely impossible for anyone with less than a genius intellect and some understanding of how her mind works. But any information is better than none. And, given the state of her village, Asuma was perplexed as to why she'd want to return. Only a few Kanoha shinobi could pose a threat to her, so it couldn't be her missing nin status. But it couldn't have been Naruto, Asuma reasoned. Actually, I had hoped. The four Kanoha nin entered an office, and Orochimaru was greeted immediately by the woman behind the desk. The office was well organized, with some shelving containing books and file folders. The woman sat in two chairs on the opposite side of the desk, which was large but not overly ornate. Orochimaru did not live up to the expectations of the Kanoha team. Orochimaru-sama, the woman said as she stood up. There's no need for you to get up, Gurin-chan. Do you have all the information these honorable Kanoha Jounin require? Hello, there are duplicates in each of their rooms. As always, efficient. Well, gentlemen, I'm sure Gurin has arranged for someone to show you to your rooms. I have other things to attend to, so I'll see you when we depart. What if we have further questions? I'm sure Gurin-chan can assist you with whatever you require, Asuma, she said as she walked out of the office. The three men waited for their guide, and when he arrived, they left the office as well. Orochimaru was relieved to see that most of her experiments had been wiped clean. That would take time at all of her bases, but Kimimaro was on the job, and with Jugo and Suaijutsu assisting him, it shouldn't take long. She knew her sensei would try to find anything that would jeopardize her agreement with the daimyo. She planned for that and other contingencies because he was so far behind the game that he'd never be able to take the initiative. She wished she could take more credit for his downfall, but her schemes and Tsunade's actions just so happened to coincide. But she had her part, so it was enough. He wouldn't be a complete non-threat once he was removed from power, but he'd be a far less formidable one. She wondered if his disgrace was sufficient. Every clan member would know, so non-clan shinobi could find out through gossip, but had it gone too far? She wondered if he could take any more losses. Haruzen and Asuma were getting closer, rebuilding their broken relationship, according to Kabuto. Why should she let that happen? Why should she give him any solace? No, his life would be one of increasing humiliations until they crushed him or he died. 
She knew exactly what she had to do. Asuma had gone over the information provided to him thoroughly, taking special care not to burn any of the documents as he smoked. He liked how the room had smoke-absorbing seals, a queen-sized bed, a desk, and his own bathroom. Not much, but he's had worse accommodations. When he heard a knock at his door, he put down his book and answered it, palming a trench knife behind his back. When he saw who was at the door, he gripped it even tighter. Can I assist you? Kyukuku, I was hoping we could talk for a bit. Asuma-kun, is that okay? He wanted to say no, but realized she was just being polite, so he opened the door completely and let her in, sliding his knife back into his holster. What can I do for you? He asked as he returned to his bed. Orochimaru remained facing him. I'm curious about you, Asuma, I've known you for years but don't really know you. What makes you tick? What gets you up in the morning? Why did you join this mission? I have no idea. I highly doubt it. I'm sure someone of your genius could read me like an open book. He said between cigarette drags. Hyukuku, you flatterer, as smooth as sensei. How are things with Ms. Yuhai? That's private, and why should you care? Why wouldn't I? She's Naruto sensei. Kun's in her life may have an impact on his. Are you only concerned about your student? Isn't that enough? Do you want me to be interested in you, Asuma? No, I'm fine. One woman is plenty for me. That's what sensei used to say, until he didn't. What exactly does that mean? Look, Asuma, you can do whatever you want, but leaving Yuhai-chan distraught may have a negative impact on Naruto-kun, which I can't have. If you're just going to run around, find someone else. For once, be better than your father. Are you saying my father had an affair behind my mother's back? No way, not in a thousand years, Honorable Sarutobai Haruzen. Are you certain? Positive. And if he had, there's no way he'd tell you. Unless, unless, Asuma said, squinting at the Sanin until the light turned on. No, I don't believe it, and I will never believe it. You don't have to. He's not the reason I'm here, just be responsible. And if you can't, at least don't force her to abort the baby. Be better than your father in that regard. Orochimaru spat and walked out of the room. She smiled all the way down the corridor. She'd be direct, and she knew Asuma's instincts would warn him that she was trying to manipulate him, pitting him against his father for some reason. He wouldn't let her, but she didn't need him to be disloyal, she just needed him to be distant. He might serve his father, but he wouldn't trust him for a long time. Unless he can completely convince himself that his father is innocent, Asuma will have doubts, and that small seed is enough. She has already won yet again. Despite the fact that the sun had only recently set, the temperature change was immediate. Suna was particularly lovely at night. Not in the same way that Kanoha was, but there was a stillness that was often difficult to find in his home village. The air wasn't as crisp or as dry, but it was still pleasant. Naruto sat on the roof of his inn, surveying the village. The Kanoha duo had just arrived earlier today. The match was scheduled for tomorrow in their Chunin exam arena, and they were scheduled to leave the next day, health permitting. It was fine traveling with Jiraiya. Naruto didn't like his sense of humor. The Gama Sanin relied too heavily on innuendo for Naruto, which felt disingenuous. Jiraiya, on the other hand, could be entertaining when he wasn't cracking pervy jokes. They talked about fuinjutsu and strategies for dealing with Gara. Naruto felt prepared because Jiraiya was pleased with his intended approach. He wanted to eat the chicken satay he had ordered from the stand, but the murderous intent directed at him made that impossible. Gara spilled killing into like a bottle with a hole and it leaked fluids. He was familiar with the source. Naruto just wished he'd do something or leave because his presence was becoming annoying. But, seeing as his fellow Jinchuriki was content to observe, Naruto decided to take action. Can you just come on out? Naruto asked, his tone irritated. Your blood is wanted by mother, Yuzumaki. Okay. Gara was taken aback for a moment. There had been numerous reactions to his declaration of his mother's desires, but never a okay. Are you not afraid? Not really, you're strong for your age, even dangerous, but there's no reason to fear you right now. What's the harm? You're not attacking me. I don't think you came here to attack me now, especially since we'll fight tomorrow, so what do you want? To tell you you're going to die tomorrow and help me prove my existence, Gara said, emerging from his stupor. How does that work? It was now Naruto's turn to be perplexed. I only exist for myself, and I prove it by killing anyone who tries to harm me. Oh that sounds lonely, do you want to murder me because we have a fight tomorrow? Yes, mother says you're strong, and thus a threat to me, I must eliminate all threats. Then you're looking at the wrong person. The guy I came here with, he cracked both of our skulls with minimal effort. That's power, we're both just exceptional for our ages, and not everyone who could harm you would want to. I haven't had that experience. Would you like to tell me about it? Why should you care, Yuzumaki? It's not going to help you beat me. Naruto sighed and rolled his eyes. I didn't think it would. Look, my food is getting cold, but I hate eating alone. 
You can come sit down and talk to me while we share this, or you can leave and let me eat in peace. I'm not trying to trick you, as far as I'm concerned we aren't enemies. Kara was initially hesitant, and his mother's voice didn't help, but he decided to sit down and share a meal with the perplexing redhead. Before Gara spoke, the two Jinchuriki sat in silence, both staring at the moon. He said the moon reminded him of the night his uncle tried to kill him, and he then told Suna about his experiences. Everyone saw him as a monster, no one cared about him, and he decided to live only for himself. I get it. I mean, no one attempted to assassinate me, not that I know of, so your situation was worse than mine, but I do understand. I used to be really angry when I was younger, angry at everything and everyone. Why did they ignore me? Why did they seem to wish I wasn't there? Why could everyone else have friends and family but me? Naruto asked. I was so angry, but I was too weak to do anything about it, so I started training. When I entered the academy and the sensei didn't like me, didn't want to treat me like everyone else, I trained even more. I wanted to prove I didn't need them. If they didn't want to teach me jutsu, I'd make my own. If they didn't want me at the academy, I'd graduate early. If the sand name didn't want to give, what? The anger never went away. I was often too tired to think about it, but it was still there in the morning to greet me, filling the silence of my life. My summons helped, I got them when I was eight and it helped having them, but it wasn't enough. The glares and the shunning were still present. Creating my own ninjutsu didn't help either, not fully. Graduating early certainly didn't. So, what did you do? Gara inquired, genuinely interested in the boy's response. I had to let it all go. Part of the reason I was still angry wasn't just because it was unfair, but because I wanted their acknowledgement. I had to accept I might never get it and truly embrace those who did see my value. In a sense, I forgave them. Not absolved, but I gave myself permission to not hate them anymore. I had my summons, I had my training, and I was starting to gain people who did see me for myself. One of the academy sensei who was so cold to me apologized a few months after I graduated and said I could come to him if I ever had any questions. A couple of Jounin helped me further my knowledge in their areas of specialty, one of whom became my Jounin sensei. I don't know what will happen tomorrow, but maybe we can try being friends after everything is settled, Naruto suggested at the end. Is this a ruse? No, Gara, no trick, but I understand why you think it might be. Even if you decide we can't be friends, try to find someone you can connect with. Living for yourself is hollow, and you don't deserve a hollow existence, Naruto said as he stepped off the roof. Gara just sat there in silent debate for a while before shunshining away as well. The near midday sun couldn't be more of a contrast to Naruto's previous night. It shone unceasingly on everything beneath it. He'd arrived at the arena 20 minutes earlier, waiting for the farce to begin. The arena was packed with Suna Shinobi and civilians, which irritated Naruto even more. He'd be going to war with an organization of S-rank Shinobi soon, so he'd want to broadcast his techniques to anyone who was interested. This was extremely stupid. Not that Gara wasn't a difficult opponent, he'd have to stay sharp to avoid serious injury but it just seemed pointless. He was a shinobi, and this was a cockfight, even more so than the Chunin exams, because it served no purpose other than to pique one man's curiosity. Naruto despised people who abused their authority, especially when it was for stupid reasons like this. The fact that the man attempted to murder his own son only fueled his hatred. As far as Naruto was concerned, the Keisgage was a scumbag. The proctor, the Jounin who accompanied Gara to Konoha, signaled a start, and Gara immediately sent his sand after Naruto. Naruto, wisely, moved quickly, performing a shunshin to distance himself from his opponent. Naruto ran into some limitations when devising a strategy to defeat Gara, namely Gara's sand defense. He didn't want to kill or seriously injure an ally, but anything that could penetrate his sand defense could. When you make a hole in a person, they usually die. He'd already decided not to use his sword, blunted, it couldn't cut through Gara's defense, but edge active, it could cut something off Gara. That was just one more reason why this fight blew a big one. Naruto decides to go on the offensive and performs another shunshin to close the distance and test Gara's defense's reaction speed. Naruto appears to the right side of Gara and throws a kick, but the sand intercepts it, colliding with his shin before he can make contact. Undaunted, he spins around with increased speed and aims a hit on Gara's back, but the sand again blocks him, despite getting closer. Naruto increases his speed again, performing a three-hit combination to Gara's left side. Two were stopped, but the last one got away, and Gara ate the body blow. Naruto was unable to respond as he felt the sentient sand close around his fist. He dashed backward to regain some distance, signaling the end of their first conversation. 
The crowd, including the Keisgich, was stunned that someone had managed to overcome Gara's defenses with only Teijutsu. Gara was upset because he had never been hit before. Baruto was shaking off the pain he was experiencing when he noticed Gara had a layer of sand on his skin. He was taking deep breaths, not because the exchange was difficult, as his natural stamina and training would allow him to do much more, but because the adrenaline of trying to avoid the sand defense was too much for him. It was exactly as he had predicted. His Teijutsu would be of limited use. The required degree of near perfection with him at near top speed was a waste of resources unless he first softened Gara up. Gara had gotten over his shock and discomfort, his sand armor absorbing most of the impact and making the pain he felt dull to begin with. He chose to take the initiative this time, rather than letting Naruto attack as he pleased. Naruto felt the ground move beneath him and backflip just as sand appeared beneath him. The sand began to pursue Naruto, but he managed to dip and dodge each attempt. He was so focused on the sand that he didn't notice the sand spear coming at him until it was too late. Naruto narrowly avoided serious injury, but it did graze his side, bloodying the Uzumaki. Naruto reacted by grabbing his side and stopping his movement, allowing Gara to finally capture him with his sand, by his ankle. Naruto thought quickly and moved even faster. He launched two kanai into the air, both hurtling at breakneck speeds. Before Gara could perform his sand coffin, Naruto replaced himself with one of the kanai and watched as his kanai was crushed by the jutsu. Naruto grabbed the second kanai he saw as he appeared right beside it, channeling supersonic chakra into it and throwing it at the sand user on instinct alone. As Naruto collapsed, he watched as the kanai ripped through Gara's initial defense and pierced his sand armor at the shoulder, slicing him cleanly. When Gara's blood began to spill from his wound, everything seemed to come to a halt. The audience was unusually quiet, unable to believe what they were witnessing. Their trance was soon broken when they heard a shrill scream. Blood, it's my blood, he screamed, quickly erecting a sphere of dense sand around himself. Naruto was at a loss for what to do next. He could get past the defense, he'd proven that, but it would only hurt Gara, and the boy was clearly unstable. If he took advantage, the Jinchuriki might do something regrettable, and a lot of people might get hurt, even if some of them deserved it. And Naruto didn't want that on his conscience, so he waited. And my blood, my blood, Gara said again, having a conversation that no one could hear. You must murder him. He, like the rest of them, only wants to hurt you. You don't need him or anyone else. Does mother have a point? Was he telling the truth? Is he the same as everyone else? Do you just want to deny my existence? Gara was perplexed by his brief dinner with the Yuzumaki. That pain he saw in the other boy's eyes was so familiar to him. Only someone who had been through a similar hell of loneliness could have that look. But what could he make of this? The boy pretended to want to be friends but injured him. He was deceiving me. People lie to kill you, that's what they do. You must murder him. I must. But why hasn't he attacked me again if he's trying to kill me? Because we have too much power. His ruse will not work again. Just let me out and I'll look after him. And I'll kill all of your enemies for you. You could probably kill them all, Gara agreed. With no difficulty, release me and I'll do exactly that. And where would I be then? Alone. You don't need anyone else. Nobody else matters, you only need me. Then why hasn't the pain ever stopped? Why is it that no matter how many people I kill, it always hurts? You just haven't killed everyone who opposes you. Once you do, you'll see, it'll be better. You're telling the truth. Your method does not work, and it has never worked. Gara reflected. Release me right now. You're nothing without me, so let me go. No, no, I will not. I'm going to take a different path, and you won't be able to stop me, Gara said, abruptly ending the conversation. He'd only been making his sand dome for a few minutes, but everyone was waiting to see what he'd do next. His siblings expected to see the miniature sand monster emerge because Gara had used it before, but they were surprised when the dome collapsed and all that remained was Gara holding his injured shoulder. He gave Naruto a small smile, and Naruto nodded in agreement. After a brief moment of silence, the match resumed. Gara tried to trap Naruto in his sand once more, but this time he was much more careful and Naruto slipped out of his traps, even running up a wall when cornered. Naruto's side cut had healed, but lingering pain and tenderness limited his mobility. The constant sand attacks were pushing him, and he didn't like it. While his stamina may be greater than Gara's, it won't matter if he's the only one who needs to move. He avoided a sand wave and resolved to get closer. When Naruto was only a few feet away, he blurred through a series of hand signs while inhaling and then exhaling, sub-vocalizing his jutsu. Fire style, combustion stream. The jutsu made a beeline for Gara and was intercepted by his sand. Gara had not anticipated the outcome when a thin layer of sand detonated in front of him. 
The remaining sand absorbed the heat and shrapnel but not the concussive force, and Garo was thrown backward in midair, facing the sky. Naruto didn't waste any time in creating three shadow clones. One appeared beneath Gara and kicked his back. The process was repeated by the other two clones, who kicked the Suna Jinchuriki higher and higher, or further and further away from his protective sand. Before he could gather his thoughts, Gara noticed Naruto above him, holding a glowing orb in his right hand. Rasengan. He yelled angrily as he carried the underpowered jutsu in Gara's stomach, sending him down at breakneck speed. Gara landed with a thud, his sand not present to soften the blow, and everyone waited to see what would happen. Gara was clearly in pain and exhausted, as evidenced by his expression. He motioned Baki over, and the Jounin entered his ward. I give, Gara said monotonously, but with a slight smile on his face. Despite his disbelief, Baki managed to call the match for Naruto, and after a brief silence, the audience erupted in cheers and applause for the battle they had just witnessed. The Suna ninja gave both boys respectful and acknowledging looks. It warmed something deep within Naruto, and all he could do was scratch the back of his head. He waved to the audience and made his way to the exit, only to be met by Jiraiya. You did well, young man. Thank you very much, pervy sage. I told you not to call me that, brat. Get better jokes, Tebeo, and I will. Temuri and Kenkuro arrived on the arena floor by Gara and picked up their little brother, both surprised he hadn't succumbed to his biju and impressed with his fight. Temuri, Kenkuro I'm sorry, for everything, he said, and both elder siblings smiled, as if they could be a family again. Later that evening, the sand siblings dropped by Naruto's room, Gara's shoulder noticeably wrapped up, bringing a spread of native dishes and all having dinner together. Naruto enjoyed the food, especially the curried eggplant, but enjoyed the company even more. Temuri and he exchanged some ideas on wind jutsu, while Kenkuro put on an impromptu puppet show of their earlier fight, except Gara won this time. Juria wasn't having a good night. He'd been summoned to the K's kid's office and while he had no desire to talk to the man, he knew he didn't have a choice. Rasa was a hard man who thought being a hard man was a personality. Juria, through his network, knew about what the man did to his son and his attempts to kill the poor kid. He entered the office with little fanfare, Rasa only lifting his head to acknowledge Juria's presence before handing him a file folder. Juria quickly skimmed the information, not liking what he was reading at all and growing increasingly unconcerned about what the man's death would do to wind country. Why are you showing me this? Juria inquired. Because you required to know I had this. I was never convinced that your Jinchuriki was truly his son. The facts my spies were able to gather suggested as much and your interest in him did as well but seeing him fight. It just felt like Minato. Naruto fights nothing like Minato, which I should know because I raised him from a genin. You're right, their styles are nothing alike but there's an intensity of focus there. Even if the boy never knew a single one of his father's infamous jutsu, in Suna we believe the blood will tell. Given how similar Minato's and my reigns as cages were, I was curious to see who created the superior weapon. The fourth Hakage appears to have beaten me. I'm not saying Naruto is Minato's son, but Minato did not seal the Kyuubai in Naruto to make him a weapon. Of course, Jiraiya. He was far too noble for such a thing. You haven't told me what you want yet. No, nothing. However, our alliance is set to be renegotiated a few months after your planned aim invasion. I just want you to know that I have options, and that as much as Iwa despises Suna, they despise Minato Namikaze a thousand times more. I won't be screwed over by Konoha again. Jiraiya, tell your sand aim that and you can keep that file. I have copies. Jiraiya simply took the file and left. The sand siblings bid Naruto a fond farewell the next morning, and he did the same, delighted to have made three new friends. As they traveled back, Naruto could tell something was bothering Jiraiya. His jokes were even more forced, but even as Naruto called him out on his act, Jiraiya wouldn't divulge any details, so he let up but was worried about his godfather. Naruto, it is admirable you let go of your hatred but the villagers were wrong. While revenge is hollow, accountability is not. You deserve justice, my friend. He'd never really considered making the villagers pay after he'd resolved to move past his anger and resentment. He simply didn't know how to do so with the means available to him. He'd thought about and on the last night of the trip it occurred to him what he needed to do. Some may hate him for it, some may call it petty but Naruto was confident it was the right thing to do. He wasted no time arriving at the Hokage's office and gave his debrief, giving a detailed description of the fight. The old man seemed pleased with his win but truthfully, Naruto didn't care how he felt about anything. 
As soon as his debrief concluded Naruto started in on his second bit of business. Sandame Sama, I speak to you now as the heir of the Uzumaki clan as I have an official request. Haruzen looked confused as to what clan business Naruto could have but hoped it wasn't anything too serious. After his fight with Asuma he just didn't want any more bad news. What exactly is it, Naruto-kun? I'd like my clan's crest removed from all Jounin and Chunin vests, and anything else he may have appeared on. I'm revoking Konoha's right to wear it as a sign of friendship. Konoha hasn't been a friend to the Yuzumaki in a long time. Haruzen could only pinch his nose as he imagined the headache this would cause. Jiraiya hadn't just drifted off when he returned. He had a destination in mind. True, any cage would try to strengthen their negotiating position in order to do better for their village, so he couldn't fault Rasa in that regard. But he was holding a knife to Naruto's throat, and that, Jiraiya would never abide. When he arrived at his destination, he laid out everything, every detail he had in his goals. It made his skin crawl, not what he was setting in motion. He'd been an assassin for decades, but who he'd gone to for help with this. Do you want me to murder Rasa? She stated flatly. Yes, he said, waiting for her list of demands. It was going to be painful, and he was prepared to give her a pound of flesh. Okay, okay, yes, okay. He'll be dead a month before the talks are supposed to start. And what do you desire? Jiraiya, what could I possibly want from you? My body. She snorted in response. I'd rather entice Tsunade. Could I observe? And when the pervert appears, it's time for you to leave. Bye, Jiraiya. Fine, I'm leaving. But I doubt I'll let you blackmail me over this. Goodbye, Jiraiya, she said once more. Bye. Orochimaru trashed her study after Jiraiya left. She planned to kill Rasa when Suna was going to attack Konoha. But those plans changed. Now, he's made himself an impediment to her plans. And that simply could not be tolerated. Rasa would never see his children reach adulthood because he dared to threaten Naruto. So this was it for today, I will continue this series in next part, till then we weave offline.